I woke up in the morning and looked at the phone. It was 11 a.m., but I didn't have to rush to go to work because today was Saturday, favorite day of the week. I dialed up Anna. After a few moments of ringing, Anna picked up the call and said, Yeah, yeah, I remember. I'll be meeting you at the mall at 7 p.m. sharp. Happy now? I laughed and replied, <laughs> Okay, I'll see you then. I and Anna have been best friends since childhood. They went to the same school, studied in the same college, and now work at the same company as well. I got up from bed and made a warm cup of coffee. I recorded on TikTok with the tagline, Good morning to all you lovely people out there. I then sat down on the couch and started scrolling TikTok feed. Videos of food, fashion, and daily life vlogs started to come up one by one. Suddenly, I clicked on a random account. The account belonged to a guy making mime videos. He was doing tricks and making funny faces. I liked one of his videos, so I commented generously. Nice job. Keep it up. I went to make breakfast for myself. My phone received a notification. I opened it and saw the mime guy followed my account. I didn't bother much about it and got busy with my daily chores. After lunch, I watched a movie and don't exactly remember when I dozed off. I woke up hearing my phone ringing out loud. It was Anna. I answered her call. You tell me, where are you? Get ready and meet me at the mall. I saw it was 6.30 already. I got ready and left for the mall. We met near the mall gate. Anna and I clicked pictures and took so many TikTok videos. We both were kind of fans of TikTok, so wherever we went, we filmed TikTok videos. Anna bought lots of clothes. She went to trial them and I sat down near the trial room. I was waiting for her to come out when suddenly, I felt someone is watching me. I looked around the mall. There were plenty of people roaming around the mall. Everyone was busy on their own. There was a mirror at some distance from me. I saw a weird looking face hiding behind it. I didn't go check it out. Anna came wearing a dress and said, So, how do I look? I smiled awkwardly and again looked at the mirror. <sighs> Rita, tell me, should I buy this? I looked back at Anna and said, Yeah, yeah, you should buy it. Anna noticed me being distracted. She asked, What happened? Are you looking for someone? I replied, No, just thought I saw someone. We finished our shopping, then went to eat somewhere. Anna was going through the uploaded TikTok videos. She suddenly said, Hey, who's this weird mime guy standing behind you in this picture? I looked at the photo and my heart stopped. It was the same mime guy from the TikTok video this morning. How the hell he came to this mall? Then I remembered I have uploaded pictures from the moment I stepped inside the mall. Did the guy follow me here? This is an odd incident of him living in the same area where I do. It creeped me out that this guy is now at the same mall with me. And I think we should leave early. Let's take the food home. We'll eat it there. I said. Anna didn't question me further, because she understood my discomfort right at that moment. We packed the food and came out of the mall. There was a long subway on my way home. The streets were empty. The crickets chirping around with the sound of the hollow wind made my skin crawl in fear. Let's walk faster, I said to Anna. My car was parked at the end of the subway. As soon as we got into the subway, an eerie feeling grabbed my heart. Anna was looking back constantly. I realized she too got scared. Is someone following us? Anna asked. I told her about this mime guy and she got even more scared. We were walking as fast as we could when suddenly we heard a burst of creepy laughter at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> I stopped. Is anyone there? I screamed. Anna and I were panting in fear. I asked again. Is anyone there? We've called the cops, so you better run away, you creep. From the darkness of the tunnel, the mime guy came out. He laughed, terrifying both of us, and said, 
Is this how you treat your fan, Rita? Who are you? What do you want? Anna screamed. The mime guy made weird faces and said, Oh, nothing. I just want your friend to be my friend as well. You better fuck off, creep. Get lost now or, or you'll be in huge trouble. The cops are on their way. I said in a threatening voice. <laughs> the mime guy started to cry now. He was sobbing like a little child. He said in a crying voice, No one wants to be my friend. That is why I take them home and keep them in my cellar. Come on, Rita. Anna, I want to be your friend. So you guys better come with me. Suddenly, his eyes lit up like a hungry wolf. He looked at us and said in a psychotic voice, Don't make me force you. I will then have to twist your necks like little birds. Anna screamed, saying, You jerk! You think you can threaten us and get away with it? She picked up a stone lying on the ground and threw it aiming at the mime's jaw. The guy fell on the road, bleeding and screaming in pain. We then started to run towards the car. Anna ran past him. I was just about to cross him when suddenly, he grabbed my leg and started to pull me down. Before I could understand anything, the mime guy got up on me and started to lick my cheeks with his blood-soaked tongue. The more he did this freaking thing, the more he screamed in joy. The guy was utterly sick and mad at the same time. Anna hit him hard again on his head and I fainted screaming one last time. The cops came and arrested this guy. I didn't go out of the house for a month. I can't forget his scary face leaning on me till the day I die. Before starting the story, I would suggest you guys to go subscribe to the channel. It turns out that most of you guys who watch me aren't actually subscribed. So if you like the content and want to support the channel, go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell. It's free and you can always change your mind later. I recently moved out. My parents stay in California. I finished high school there and took a job in LA. I had a senior here who helped me find a small apartment perfect for myself. I've been self-dependent from a very young age, so moving out wasn't that scary for me. The apartment was already furnished enough. The only thing I needed was a new mattress. One of my colleagues at work told me there's a local Ikea store two blocks away from our workplace. So one evening I decided to head there after work. It was a warm summer night and even though I wanted to leave early, I couldn't. At around 8.30, I finally reached the IKEA store. A vast range of different types of furniture stood all around me. The store closes at 9, so I hurried to the bedding section. I was looking for a comfy sleeping mattress. There was one guy at the sales counter located near the entrance. The store was mostly empty. I stood near the mattress collection and started to go through the price tags looking for affordable prices. I looked all around, expecting a sales guy to help me out, but I didn't see anyone. I don't know how long I was checking out the mattresses. My concentration broke, hearing a voice behind me. Are you looking for anything particular, ma'am? I turned back immediately and saw an average height bony dude standing behind me wearing an employee uniform. His eyes were creepy. It wasn't just wide, but the eyeballs were almost bulging out of their eye sockets. I replied awkwardly. I would like this one. He smiled creepily and said, We do have some more collections at the back, and those will come at a good discount too. If you want, I can show you. I thought it won't harm to check some more options out, so I said, Sure, show me. The man started to walk towards the end of the store, and I followed him there. As soon as we reached the left corner of the store, I realized maybe this was a bad idea. This particular area was quite far away from the entrance, and dark too. I could see wrapped furniture scattered all over the place. The man pointed out to a pile of mattresses put up against the wall and said, Why don't you check those? Hope you find what you're looking for. And smiled even bigger this time. I nervously walked towards the pile and started to go through the price tags. I could tell from my peripheral vision that the man kept watching my every single move like a creep. 
I turned back at him and said, Um, I think I'm going to go for the first one. The man was standing right in front of the way, leading to the entrance. My heartbeat got faster, because I knew he was blocking my way, and there were no security cameras nearby. The man replied, There are some more in the basement too. If you come with me, I, I can get you a good deal. That moment I decided to man up, and confront him for his creepy behavior. I said, No thanks, I've made up my mind. Let's go to the first section, shall we? Suddenly, the man covered his face with his hands and started to sob like a child. <laughs> I definitely wasn't expecting this to happen. I said, Um, what happened? He looked at me and I saw his tearful, wide eyes. There was a pain in his face, yet I couldn't help but feel awkward with his behavior. The man said, Please, please stop me. I replied, Stop from what? Are you alright? He looked at his hands mysteriously, and then looked at me again. Listen, if you're feeling sick, we can call for the paramedics. Let me ask the man in the counter. I started to walk past him to reach out for help, just when he grabbed my hand tightly and said, You have to stop me before I kill again. I don't want to do this anymore. The ground beneath my feet started to shiver. What? What are you- Oh my god! I tried to ask for help, but before I could do so, a huge punch hit my face, knocking me out in a second. When I woke from my slumber, I noticed myself tied to a chair. I slowly opened my eyes and looked around. My left eye was throbbing with pain. I realized that the psycho guy had abducted me. Help me! Somebody please help me! I'm here! I screamed as loud as I could. Suddenly, I heard a muffled gagging sound coming from behind me. I was tied tight, so it was impossible to move a muscle. I realized that there was someone with me in this room. I pushed myself at the back and accidentally fell on the floor. I hit my head, but what I saw terrified me like hell. There was a man tied to another chair. He was wearing a pair of jeans and had bruises all over his face. Someone beat him up brutally. The man said in a painful, sobbing voice, He stole my uniform. Call, call the cops. And then passed out. I heard footsteps coming down the stairs. I realized we were in a basement area. I screamed, Is somebody here? Please, please help us! But then I heard the same sobbing sound. I told you to stop me. Why didn't you? The man wearing the Ikea uniform came in front of me. I realized this guy is an imposter. He not only abducted me, but also beat the shit out of an actual salesman of the Ikea unit. You crazy psycho! Don't think you're gonna get away with this! The cops will find you and you will rot in jail! The man then looked at me with an expressionless face and started to laugh all of a sudden. <laughs> Then he said, It's not the first time that I'm doing this, you know. I started to breathe heavily. I understood this guy is a serial killer. He came closer to me and lifted me from the floor. He then faced me towards the poor guy and said, Tell me, do you like gory movies? And took out a gun from his pocket. He slowly walked towards the unconscious man on the chair and stood behind him, looking directly at me. I started to cry in terror. Why? Why are you doing this? Please, let us go. What have we done? The man screamed like crazy and said, Be quiet. You are interrupting me with your bullshit now. You won't realize how much fun it is until you do it. He then lifted his hand and placed the gun behind the man's head. The man got back to his senses and said in a dizzy voice, What? What's happening? What is this? I screamed at the top of my lungs. No, please don't! And at that moment, a loud gunshot took place, almost making my ears numbed. That psycho shot that poor salesman from point-blank range. His blood splattered on my face, and I screamed one last time. 
My voice got choked, and I sat there, silently sobbing. My entire life flashed in front of my eyes while the psycho started to walk towards me. I knew my end was near, and probably like his other victims, no one will know about me and that poor Ikea salesman. He then came close to me and whispered in my ear, Don't suffer so much. I hate when they suffer like this. It'll only take a second. Now close your eyes, doll. I closed my eyes as tears rolled down my cheeks. I could hear my breath as I waited for death. The man placed the warm gun on my forehead, burning my skin a bit, but I didn't feel that pain anymore. I heard the trigger being pulled back one more time. Then the man said, for the last and final time, Ready or not, here it comes. When I opened my eyes, I saw cops running around me, and the psycho lying on the floor, coughing blood. His eyes looked at me, and then he never blinked. It's been five days since I was released from the hospital. The man at the counter was about to close the store when he realized he saw a girl entering the unit, but never saw her leaving the place. So, he decided to check the footage just when he found me standing near the mattress area, talking to a guy and then following him to the other side of the store. He recognized that the guy is not their salesman. Moreover, he's an infamous serial killer that the cops were looking for. He rushed there and found the basement door locked. He called the cops immediately and also heard the first gunshot. I was lucky enough that the cops reached me as soon as they did and saved me from this devil before he shot me, just like the poor salesman. I might have to undergo therapy. I'm now boarding a flight to San Francisco to stay with my parents. I don't know when I'll be able to move out again and live on my own. This happened in my college days. I'm an extroverted person, so I like meeting new people and making friends. Within the first semester, I made quite good friends, and we all often hung out together. There was a guy in our group named Steven. As students, we mostly stayed as paying guests or in hostels. Only Steven owned a house on the outskirts of the city. We were all young and looking for thrills all the time. Steven's house became the main place of our weekend parties and a popular place to hang out. We mostly spent nights at his place after getting heavily drunk at a party. The house had four bedrooms, two on the upstairs floor and two downstairs. Steven's room was the biggest in the house. Even though the house was spacious, Steven's room felt claustrophobic to me. Maybe it was because everyone got high in his room and drank there. Steven rarely cleaned the house, hence there was always a funky smell in the air of the home. We were a group of five people, including Steven. Molly and I were the girls in the group, and there were Robert and David. Molly and David were dating at the time, hence they were always busy on their own, which left me hanging out with Steven and Robert most of the time. Steven was a cheerful, happy-go-lucky guy. Maybe this is why none of us could see it coming. Steven had a troubled childhood. His father was an alcoholic. His mom divorced his dad when Stephen was in high school. Since then, Stephen never saw his father. He heard from his mother that his father died in the hospital due to liver failure last year. This house once belonged to Stephen's father, which his mom inherited after his death. Stephen hardly talked about his father, but whenever he did, we could see a suppressed feeling of sorrow on his face. What felt weird to me was even though Stephen's father lived in this house, there wasn't a single picture of him anywhere. None of us showed any curiosity to know about Stephen's past because it would have been too much to step into his personal life. Every Saturday, we traveled to his house and spent our weekends. As time passed, we all started to notice weird things in Stephen. He never liked opening the windows of the home. There was a corner table in his room that had a Bible and a statue of Jesus Christ. It was set up by his mother because Stephen told us she's very religious, but never once saw Stephen touch any of it. One day, Molly went to lit a candle on that table. Stephen became so uncomfortable immediately. He stopped Molly from doing so and said, Let those things be, Molly. Anyways, Mom will come next month to take all of these with her. So we ignored it and let it be. The more we stayed at his place, 
the more we realized that there was something not right about our friend and his house. We all started to have nightmares and feel unnaturally cold around the house, even in summer. One weekend, I was alone in Stephen's house. Molly and David were on their way. Stephen and Robert went out to get booze and dinner for everyone. I decided to stay at the house in case Molly and David arrived early. I took a shower and was going upstairs to change into my pajamas. The bathroom was downstairs and I had to pass Stephen's room to take the stairs. As soon as I came in front of the room, my jaw dropped. I saw a bald man sitting on Stephen's bed, facing his back towards me. He wasn't wearing any clothes, as I could see his bare back. Excuse me? Who the hell are you? How did you get inside? The man didn't say anything. He didn't even turn back. I started to walk towards the main door because I was already scared to see a stranger in my friend's house. The man suddenly started to shake his head in a very bizarre way. He wasn't turning back, wasn't speaking, just shaking and moving his bald head vigorously. I screamed seeing this horrible incident and came out on the house porch in my bathrobe. A car pulled in the driveway and I saw Robert running to me. What happened, Pamela? There's... there's a man inside, he's... I couldn't finish my sentence as I was still gasping for air. Robert rushed inside and checked every nook and corner of the house. He even checked all the doors and windows. There's no one in the house. Pam, are you sure you saw someone? I walked inside while my heart was still beating like a wild horse. I peeked into Stephen's room, but there was no one there. The man was gone. It was as if he disappeared into thin air. What happened? What's going on? Stephen kept the bags and asked, Robert laughed and said, Pam just got scared. She's not used to living alone, I guess. Our little Miss Pamela. <laughs> I felt embarrassed because at that point I also started to think it was just a hallucination. But Stephen didn't laugh. He came close to me and said in a low voice, Did you see someone? Yeah. I was going upstairs just when I saw a bald man sitting on your bed. He was... Did you see his face? No, I couldn't. Come on, Stephen, you don't actually think there was a man in this house. There's no way he could escape the house without using the front door. And if that happened, we would have all seen him. Also, I checked the entire house. There's no way he can hide either. Robert replied. Stephen didn't say anything. He went to the kitchen to arrange for dinner. I went upstairs, changed into my pajamas, and kept thinking about what just happened a few moments back. Why did Stephen ask me if I saw the man's face or not? Did he also believe what I saw was real? After dinner, everyone sat down and started to watch a movie. We were drinking beer, and Molly and David couldn't come that day, so it was just the three of us that night. Robert and I were sitting on the couch, while Stephen stood near the kitchen window. He just got awfully quiet. I went to him and asked, Is everything okay, Stephen? He didn't even look at me. The awkward silence was becoming very uncomfortable. I decided to go to bed, and as I turned to walk away, Stephen said, I talk to my father sometimes. What? What are you saying? I asked in a shocking voice. Robert immediately paused the game and looked at him with shocking eyes. I have this picture of him in my wallet. I talk to him sometimes. I ask him why he left me why he never came to see me or even talk to me. Hey, I get you're sad about all this. Maybe you should talk to your mother about this sometimes. I got spooked hearing Stephen. It is really weird to talk about a dead person's picture. I said in a broken voice, Um, Stephen, this is not natural to talk to a dead person's picture. You should stop doing that. I mean, but he replies to me. I feel him in this house. He comes to see me when I'm asleep. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. Robert and I kept looking at Stephen's face. He was smiling in a very creepy way. We could tell his mental condition is not stable, that he needs medical supervision. We decided to lay him on the bed and inform his mother about his unhealthy behavior the next day. Stephen was drunk too, so he didn't resist us. Robert and I carried him to his bedroom. He kept muttering, 
Trust me, guys. He talks to me. He comes. He comes. Stephen passed out on his bed. Robert and I came out and sat in the living room. Both of us were freaking out hearing Stephen's words. We watched the movie for some more time. Don't exactly remember when, but Robert and I both fell asleep. I dozed off on the couch and Robert was sleeping on the floor. I woke up and found the eerie house in complete darkness. There was a chilling sensation in the air of the house. I was feeling very thirsty. Hence, I got up and started to walk towards the kitchen to get some water. I thought of checking on Stephen, so I tiptoed to his bedroom. As I pushed the door, my heartbeat stopped for a while. That same bald man was floating over Stephen's chest and watching him with blood-red eyes. He wasn't blinking, just watching him and breathing heavily. A foul smell choked my lungs. It was the smell of rotten flesh. I couldn't move, couldn't scream. The man then stooped down and sat on Stephen's chest. He then opened his big mouth and started to suck the life out of my friend. I could see Stephen's soul drifting in the air and going into his mouth. Stephen was becoming pale and bloodless. This demon was killing my friend. I couldn't hold it longer and I screamed at the top of my lungs. The demon looked at me and I saw blood dripping from his wide, burning eyes. His hollow, dark mouth made my skin crawl. Robert woke up hearing my scream. Pam, what happened? Stephen, that guy. I sat down on the floor holding my face in my hands. We had to hospitalize Stephen that night. His blood pressure broke down rapidly. Doctors could not make out how a young boy's pulse rate fell rapidly. His heart could have stopped that day if we didn't bring him into the hospital at the right time. That was the last time I went to Stephen's house. I still talk to him sometimes, but he never mentions his father. I don't think that evil spirit I saw that night was Stephen's father. He probably latched itself to Stephen when he kept talking to his dead father's photograph. I still think that haunting spirit is staying in that house. I am highly terrified of this web platform called OnlyFans. A few years back, I was dating this girl from my workplace. We met through mutual friends, and she was strikingly beautiful. Every guy at the office approached her, and she rejected all of them. Even though I had a crush on her, I never told her, because I knew she would reject me as well. One afternoon, I was sitting in the cafeteria talking to a female colleague of mine. She came to give some files to her, and we got introduced. There was something magical in her smile that blew my mind right away. We only talked for five to ten seconds, and her attractive stare pierced my heart. I tried my best to control my reactions, but I was pretty sure she saw me anyway. After coming home, I cooked dinner. I turned on the TV to watch a game while eating my dinner. As the game ended, I decided to go to bed, just when I got a text from that girl. Hi, Betty here. Took your number from Sally. My heartbeat got faster that she asked for my number on her own and texted me as well. We chatted for almost an hour that night. The more I spent time with Betty, the harder I fell for her. She had dreamy eyes and a perfect figure to attract everyone's attention around her. We became closer and started dating. We went on trips and I introduced her to my common friends. Betty often stayed back at my place. I told her everything about me, but on the contrary, she shared very little about herself. I've never been to her place, but these small issues never struck me because I was too blind to think otherwise. Whatever she told me or asked me, I did without questioning her once. Being with her made me feel why people say love is blind. After a few months of dating, Betty told me that she needed to find an apartment, as her previous place had been sold out to a permanent tenant. I asked her that if she wanted to move in with me, because I was serious about us at that moment. She replied with a spontaneous yes, as if she was waiting for me to ask her this question. I was happy that I had finally found someone to share my life with. Betty could be a bit forceful when it came to things she wanted. 
She wanted a big house, which was quite unnecessary for two people right at the moment. But to make her happy, I rented a bigger house, and we moved in there. Betty left her job, saying she wanted to teach online classes, as it'll be an easy way to make money from home. I didn't stop her, or rather, I couldn't. I let her do the things she wanted to do. I left for the office every morning, and when I came home, I often saw Betty dressed too nicely. I asked her why she dressed like that every evening, to which she often replied she wanted to look beautiful for me. I felt lucky to have so much of her attention, but something strange started to happen. Every morning I woke up with a throbbing headache. My health started to deteriorate with time. I thought this might be happening off the stress in my workplace, so I shrugged it off. But the problems started to grow bigger with time. I started noticing small bruises on my body, which I had no idea about. What felt even more strange to me was that Betty didn't even notice all these changes. One day, I was sitting in my cabin all tired and worked up when my colleague, Cindy, came to me. Um, Andrew, are you alright? You don't look good, man, she said. I smiled and replied. Yeah, the work stress is just getting to me. I'm thinking about taking a break and going on vacation with Betty. I saw Cindy getting extremely awkward as soon as I mentioned Betty's name. I noticed the change in her behavior and asked, Is everything okay, Cindy? She looked here and there and said, Um, you're doing good in your work. Maybe it's time for Betty to quit her OnlyFans account. I mean, this can be negative for your reputation in the office and also if you are serious about her. I said in a shocking voice, What? Betty has an OnlyFans account? Honestly, I had no problem with her using the site, but I did expect her to tell me before opting for such a way of income. Now it became clear to me why she dressed so explicitly inside the house. I said to Cindy, How did you come to know about it? She smiled awkwardly and said, Well, one of my friends subscribed to her account. It's nothing, she's just posting some, you know, eye-catching content, but she can do so much better than that, Andrew. You should talk to her. I decided to confront her after going home that night. I didn't scream or overreact. I sat down and asked her, Betty, do you have an OnlyFans account? I saw the color of her face change. She promptly replied, Um, I wanted to tell you, but... Wait, how did you know about it? I told her that's not important, but I expected her to be honest with me. She said in an upset face, I feel like I pushed you to invest so much time into buying this house. This is why I thought that this could be a good way to earn some good money in a short period. After hearing that, I obviously couldn't be angry at her anymore. I realized she just wanted to help me and nothing else. I felt ashamed to doubt her for one second. I comforted her and told her she didn't have to choose this way to help me out. Betty hugged me tightly and deleted her account right in front of me. We went out on a dinner date and things got back to where they were. But surprisingly, my morning headaches and bruises didn't stop. On a Sunday afternoon, Betty was busy showering. She kept her phone on the bed. I was watching some videos on my phone when I heard sounds of notifications coming from her phone. Her phone rang repeatedly, as if many messages came in all at once. I casually checked her phone, and as I opened the screen lock, I saw five to six texts in her notification. I clicked on the texts, and it redirected me to OnlyFans. I was extremely shocked to see Betty maintaining her OnlyFans profile, even though she just deleted it in front of me a few days back. But as I scrolled down to the profile, my heart stopped. It wasn't her only profile. It was rather a different profile, under a pseudonym. But this profile didn't have the usual contents that one could expect on an OnlyFans page. Some of the videos chilled my bones and explained everything that was happening to me for the past several weeks. She uploaded creepy torture videos on her profile, and in those videos, the victim <laughs> is none other than me. There were videos where I was dead asleep in this very room, on this very bed while Betty sat on me with a sharp knife looking at the camera, giving a huge smile. There was nothing magical in her smile. Rather, it was haunting and terrifying. This is not the Betty I know. 
She then made small cuts on my body, letting blood come out from it. She then licked my blood and looked at the camera. She started to laugh like crazy, <laughs> making bizarre faces. I immediately <laughs> understood that all those headaches were nothing but being drugged somehow. Betty gave me pills to make me unconscious, just to film these sick videos. And night after night, she kept abusing me in my sleep, just for some sick popularity and money. I got up right at that moment and went to her bathroom. I heard her humming a song and taking a bath. She seemed so innocent, but I knew she was not. I locked the bathroom door, grabbed my stuff, and left the house. I was more heartbroken than scared of being used by a woman I loved with all my heart. I never called her back or tried to contact her. Surprisingly, she never tried to find me either. I hope she understood that I discovered her dark secret because I left her phone on the bed like that. I once searched for her account to see if she was still using the OnlyFans platform. The account is still there, and she is still uploading such bizarre videos of torture and abuse. Except, in those videos, the victim is a new guy. I want to report her to the cops, but I know how extremely smart she is. And maybe, I still couldn't get over her. I'm stuck in a very bad place. When I was younger, I wanted kids more than anything else in the world. But when I discovered I would never be able to carry children of my own, I decided to be a foster parent. My husband was happy to do this with me, since alternative methods of having our own children were well out of our affordable range. We fostered children for years, and though every child has had their own issues and challenges, I've loved them all. There was one child we took in that was different though, the last child we ever provided a temporary home for. Simon wasn't immediately different than the other children we had cared for, but there was always something off-putting about him. He was quiet, withdrawn almost. It wasn't uncommon for children who came from less fortunate situations, but I didn't have any solid information about his past. For some reason unknown to me, the organization wouldn't tell me anything about him other than his age and his name. I'm usually always given at least a minimal briefing on the child's past. I have to know what could trigger them. There are always topics to avoid and different ways to be sensitive to different situations. With Simon, we had to go in blind. I was left to draw my own conclusions as to what horrors he might have seen. He didn't appear to have any visible scars, and when I tried to hug him, he didn't flinch. A good sign. Children of abuse typically flinch whenever there are arms raised. I had no interest in pressing him for where he came from. I figured as he got comfortable, he would open up to me. So I began the all-star treatment that I'd had success with in the past. We let him choose a color to paint his room and did it all together. I should have taken note of the color he jumped to right away, but I just wanted to make him happy. Giving him the power to make choices was one of the first steps to him feeling safe, and so we painted his room an obnoxious blood red. When I asked Simon what else he might like to decorate his room with, he thought on it for a long moment. I expected him to blurt out fire trucks or superheroes, but I had been wrong. Maybe some skulls, or fire, or how about both? This was the first excited thing I heard come out of his mouth, and truthfully, I was a bit disturbed. I laughed it off in the moment, thinking he had just been acting out, just one of the many red flags that I would ignore during his stay. This was the point I decided to try to ask Simon about his past. I figured I might try asking if he had been to certain places as a way to ease into asking where he had lived before. But before I could get much out, he seemed to sense my unease. Are you scared of me, mommy? All of my mommies are scared of me. He smirked. All of your mommies? Of course not, sweetheart. Why would you say that? I tried to keep a smooth expression, despite my concern in his statement. Don't worry, mommy. You'll be scared soon. He stared at me blankly for a long moment, and then started laughing hysterically. After that comment, Simon refused to say anything else on the topic. I asked him why his mommies were scared of him, and he was silent. As you could probably guess, I was confused and slightly worried by this, 
but the organization hadn't given me anyone to contact. I'd only seen his social worker when he arrived, but they hadn't given me her contact number and I'd never met her before that day. One day, I was working in the garden. Simon was running around. Simon, slow down, I said in a loud voice. He looked at me and started to run towards me making a very weird face. I just stood there and watched him coming towards me. I was feeling uncomfortable, but I didn't move thinking that he was just trying to play with me. He came very close to me and gestured his hands in a stabbing motion. I said, What are you trying to do? He smirked and replied, I was checking to see if you were afraid of dying or not. Simon, you can't say things like that, you know? <laughs> I have done way more than I spoke. And he walked towards the house. I don't know how long I stood there, stunned with fear. I decided to follow up on his whereabouts. I went to that organization the next day. As I inquired about him to the manager of the organization, I saw his face turning pale. He said, Why? Did he try to hurt anyone? I was utterly shocked to hear such a statement, because why would someone say something about a little child for no reason? I looked at the man with a very angry face and almost screamed, saying, Will anyone tell me what the hell is wrong with this child? The man then said Simon was adopted by two other families, and each family suffered mysterious accidents resulting to the death of child, and don't know why those parents claimed Simon was involved in those accidents some way. The general manager looked at me and said, Ma'am, we're trying to contact his real parents. You will be the first to be informed once we've dug out any single information on him. Till then, watch him and be careful. His last words, be careful, ran a shiver down my spine. I got into the car and drove home. The moment I stepped inside the house, I received the shock of my life. Simon was sitting on the floor, holding my other foster child, Carrie, by her neck. He placed a sharp knife on her neck and stared at me with hatred and disgust. Simon, what are you doing? This is dangerous, let her go! Carrie kept sobbing out of fear. I walked closer to him, just when, Don't try and come closer, or I'll cut her open. Words like that coming from a child is definitely not something one is used to hearing. I realized that the only way to stop him from doing something crazy is to calm him down with my words. Baby, let her go. Mommy is here to take care of you. You don't want to do this, Simon. Really? If you wanted to take care of me, then why did you go back to the organization? Carrie told me you went there to find my real parents. I don't want my real parents. I don't have any real parents. They are all dead. My body was numb in fear. What are you saying, Simon? What happened to your parents? I burned the house down while they slept. I still recall their screams and cherish those memories. <laughs> Suddenly, my eyes went to the glass window and I saw my husband standing there and gesturing me to keep calm. I realized that he probably had called the cops by now. All we had to do was save Carrie from Simon. That way he couldn't hurt him. I started to sob. Simon, baby, please let her go. We can all be a family. I love you. Daddy loves you. Why are you doing this? Daddy doesn't love me, but I thought you really did. But you broke my trust, and now here's your punishment for that. He lifted the knife aiming at Carrie's throat. I jumped. No! I ended up guarding Carrie with my hand, but before I could pull her out from Simon's grasp, he slashed my arm. Ah! My husband bolted inside and unarmed Simon immediately. Simon was screaming like a hungry wolf, and his eyes were burning like hellfire. My husband held him tightly so that he couldn't do anything or hurt anyone. The cops finally came and took Simon to a correctional facility. This experience is why Simon was the last foster child we ever raised. I couldn't face the thought of caring for another murderous child. He has no recollection of the darkness he held. He still loves his home with us. The last time I went to visit him at the correctional home, he looked at me with the same lifeless stare and said, You were the first mommy who wasn't scared of me. And you'll be my last mommy, too. My name's Samuel. Everyone calls me Sam. 
I rented this house close to my workplace, and I pay moderately less amount of rent in comparison to other tenants in my locality. The reason behind the low rent is nothing but the history of the house. Let me first show you around. So, this is the living room. That's my kitchen, and you see the stairs going up. That leads to my bedroom. And you see this long corridor at the end of my living room. It goes down to the basement. I haven't used the basement because... Oh, that must be the delivery guy. I'll TikTok you guys after dinner. Samuel Johnson works in an IT company. He is originally from Canada, but he moved to London for his job. Apart from being an IT guy, Samuel has a secret passion. He considers himself a paranormal researcher slash ghost hunter. He saw an advertisement for this house on social media. The history of this house made him rent it without a single doubt. Yes, this house has a bizarre past. This two-story wooden house was built around the 1970s. A lady named Catherine lived here with her little daughter. Her husband worked in the army. One night, she received a call about her husband's death. She became mad in sorrow. Most of the time, she wandered around the house like a ghost. The death of her husband shocked her so much that she became unable to take care of her daughter. Her daughter went to play in the basement one day. As soon as the little girl went downstairs, she found Catherine hanging by her neck from the cellar. The child, too little to respond, sat down under her mother's hanging corpse and watched her for the entire night. After four days, when the mailman smelt bad odor coming from the house, he informed the neighbors and the cops. The cops found Catherine's decayed corpse that almost turned into a skeleton hanging from the cellar. They also discovered the little girl had starved to death underneath it. The tenant warned Sam about the house's terrible backstory, but Sam rented it anyway. Hey guys, I'm back. So, as I was telling you, this house has a sad past. A poor lady committed suicide in the basement, and her little daughter also died out of starvation down there. I'm the first person to rent this house in a long time, and there's no record of who lived here after Catherine and her daughter. But people say no one has been able to spend more than a night in this house. Hence, all that I am going to share with you is utterly from my personal experience. It is 9 p.m. already, and the tenant has strictly prohibited me from using the basement at night after sundown. I haven't stepped into the basement now, but I will in time. All that happens in this house tonight will be shared with you guys through my TikTok videos, so I hope you enjoy it. So, buckle up and let's, uh, let's do some ghost hunting. If there are any ghosts. Okay. That could be a wiring problem, right? So... Everything was going all right until one evening I came home from work and I found freshly made handprints on the wall. As you can see, these prints are of a child's hand and I live alone. I don't have a neighbor who has a child this small, also I lock my house perfectly. Without a break-in, no one can enter here. I can tell you all that this paint is fresh, like someone recently made these handprints. These weren't here when I moved in. Not just this, though, I, I encounter a bad reeking smell every day after the sun sets. Like, right now, there's an odd smell in the entire air of the house, as if something died in here. Last night, I was sleeping upstairs in my room. I, I'm kind of a light sleeper. I, I woke up with a little amount of sound. I heard footsteps down here in the living room. The footsteps were quite disoriented, as if a child was running around. I came down the stairs to check, but... I found nothing. Apart from all of that, my things keep getting misplaced. Suppose I kept this lamp in this corner here. When I wake up in the morning, I find it in a completely different room. Dude, I hope you are not messing with me right now. Did you guys see a shadow moving behind me? Someone in the comments told me he saw a shadow moving behind me. I think I'm gonna believe him because there is definitely a supernatural presence residing in this house. <sighs> I've decided to sleep downstairs for the night and film myself. I'll share the video with you guys, so stay tuned with me. Good night. Hey guys, I just woke up hearing a door closing hard. 
I've checked almost the entire house, but I found all my doors were completely locked. Now for the most horrifying part. My camera has two hours of footage so far, and I would like to show that to you guys right now. I haven't watched it yet, so I'm going to watch it with you guys. So are we ready, guys? Let's do it. Oh my god! Did you guys see that? Trust me, I have no idea who this woman or child are. I probably should leave this house right now. I, I can't stay here anymore. There is no doubt that this house is haunted. Did you guys... You guys heard that, right? Shit, man. Okay, I have no idea how this door is open right now because I still have the key that I didn't use to unlock this door. Fuck it, I'm leaving. Oh my god, what's happening? No, no, no! Samuel Johnson, a 28-year-old man from Canada, was found dead last night in this house. In the morning, when Sam didn't attend his office for an important meeting, his colleague came to his house to get some documents. Even after ringing the doorbell several times, Sam didn't open the door. His colleague got suspicious and called the landlord. They both entered the house and found the house completely ravaged. They walked down the basement and discovered Sam's lifeless body hanging from the cellar. The cops have found some weird footage that Sam uploaded to his TikTok account last night. So far, no one knows what happened exactly. Cops are investigating his mysterious death. I was an avid user of the website OnlyFans. My name is Sarah, I'm 24 years old, and this happened last year. I took a job in a beauty salon. Needless to say, it didn't pay much, hence I was desperately looking for a side income. My roommate Dolly was a shy girl. She was working in a small startup. The house we stayed in was a two-storied home. I was unable to pay the rent with just one source of income. Dolly was so kind to me that sometimes she covered my side of the rent as well. One day, I decided that I couldn't keep going like this, and I had to figure out a way to make money. That's when I came across the website OnlyFans. I opened an account and within a month acquired a moderate fan base. Things started to look up for me as I managed to earn some extra cash using the website. One afternoon, I was chatting with my fans when a new subscriber texted me. Hello, beautiful. How about a close-up of your beautiful body? I replied by sending a picture with a $5 unlock fee. The guy paid $5 immediately and unlocked the picture. He then said, send me a picture of your feet. I didn't think much of it and sent another $5 unlock fee. He paid again. He started asking me to send pictures of my body parts separately. At first, I didn't think much of it, but with time, his requests, he started to become creepy. He said, Tell me, hon, how does your skin feel? 
I felt uncomfortable with this question. I replied, just like everybody else's. He replied, no, everyone's skin feels different. I bet yours feels soft. I sent a smiling emoji and decided to call it a day. I was about to go offline just when I received another text from the same guy. I will pay you $50 right now if you give me your number. I was surprised. Man, this guy is desperate. I didn't want to share my personal info, but at the same time, I could use that $50. I mean, all that money just for my phone number. What maximum harm can it bring? I can always block him whenever I want. So I agreed with him. He paid the money as soon as I shared my number. That night, I went to bed with a smile, thinking I will be able to start college again as I had managed to save enough to pay for the college fees. Around 2.30 in the morning, my phone rang. I was in a deep sleep, hence it took me some time to figure out everything. I woke up and saw an unknown number. Hello? Uh, who is this? No one spoke, but I could hear someone's heavy breathing coming from the other side. Excuse me, who are you? (laughs) How does your skin feel when you sleep on it, Sarah? I realized it was the same guy from last night who paid me $50 for my number. I kept calm and said, Don't you think it's a bit late to call someone at this hour? (laughs) I paid you $50, bitch. I own you now. You are bound to answer my call whenever I want. Drops of sweat appeared on my forehead. I said in a shocked voice, How dare you? Who do you think you are, you jerk? You want to know who I am? You really want to know? Bitches like you love teasing people for money, huh? You all can go to any extent for money. Tell me, Sarah, will you let me slash your throat and stab you until your entrails come out for another hundred dollars? Think how much fun that'll be. (laughs) You piece of... I disconnected the phone immediately. I sat in my room, panting in fear. I wanted to call my roommate out loud, but I couldn't. I was feeling disgusted. His words took a toll on my mental health. He kept calling me. As I didn't pick up, he started to send me texts, making death threats. I blocked the guy's number immediately. The next morning, I deleted my OnlyFans account too. Needless to say... He sent me some scary messages there as well. I didn't tell Dolly all this at first. I couldn't go to work that day. I cried on my bed, thinking how stupid I was to share my number with a stranger, just for some cash. I was feeling ashamed to put myself in danger. At night, when Dolly came home from work, she found me asleep on the living room couch. She woke me up. Sarah? Sarah, are you alright? I slowly opened my eyes. She said, Did you eat anything the entire day? You look sick. Will you please tell me what's going on with you? I burst into tears and explained how a psycho dude threatened to kill me over the phone last night. She calmed me down. Dolly prepared food for me and we decided to go to the cops the next day to file a report about this guy. That night, I requested Dolly to sleep beside me as I was terrified to sleep alone. After dinner, we both watched a movie, just to take our mind off and drank some wine. Around 11.30, we went to sleep. It was a warm summer night. None of us had AC in our rooms for obvious financial crises, so mostly during summer, we kept our windows open. Dolly was a heavy sleeper, so she fell asleep within minutes, even though I was distracted a bit. The wine helped me to fall asleep that night. I have a habit of going to the washroom in the middle of the night. I woke up probably at around 1 to 1.30 and went to the washroom, which was at the end of the corridor. I locked the bathroom door and did my business. I was washing my hands in the sink when I heard a muffled cry. I was in a half-awake, half-sleep state, hence I thought I might have imagined it. I came out and started to walk towards my room. As soon as I came in front of my closed room door, I felt like there was something wrong. I stretched my hand to twist the doorknob, just when I heard the muffled cries again. 
What I'm going to tell you next might create a difference of opinions among you all. But trust me, I did my best that I could in that situation. Something told me that Dolly and I were not the only people in this house. Even though the room was dark, the pale moonlight coming from the window made it easy to see the room quite clearly. I could see thick liquid dripping from the tip of his knife on my floor, and Dolly was muffling in a traumatized voice. I knew that this man had already stabbed my roommate, and if I have to stop him, I can't face him empty-handed. I have to take him by surprise. There was a baseball bat in Dolly's room. I tiptoed to her room and took the bat, and then rushed towards the scene. I opened the door and bolted inside. The man was about to strike her again, and I saw Dolly fainting. Her clothes were drenched in blood. The man said in a shocked voice, Sarah? If you're here, then who is that? But I didn't wait anymore. I swung the bat hard onto his head, screaming as loud as possible. The man's lifeless body dropped onto the floor, making a loud thud. I called the paramedics and 911. Dolly got six stitches on her stomach, but thanks to God, she made it alive. The cops arrested the intruder, who was the same guy that threatened me on OnlyFans. Cops found remains of a missing girl from his house. It came out that this guy was a cold-blooded murderer who used to trap girls using platforms like OnlyFans and other social media. He has now been charged with life imprisonment. It gives me chills to this day that what if I slept in my room alone that night? I'm a single mother. My boyfriend was a drug addict, and he died of an overdose a few months back. My daughter is two years old. I had to work two jobs to support my family, but going for night shifts while leaving my daughter home alone was impossible for me. So I moved back with my mother. I took a night job as a maintenance staff in an office building. Every evening after office hours, I had to go to each floor and take out the garbage from the washroom and cafeteria. I could work in a hassle-free, quiet ambiance. There was no one to drive me crazy or poke their nose into my work. It was a 10-story building, hence the elevator was an important tool of my work schedule. I carried the big dumpster using the elevator. I stopped on each floor and emptied the dust bins on the dumpster. And finally, after getting rid of the daily waste in the basement incinerator, I was free to go home. The entire process took about three to four hours. The night job was perfect for me, as it was comparably less work with a good paycheck. The incident that I'm going to tell now happened recently, so excuse me if my words seem clumsy, because I'm still in shock. It was a Friday night. Generally, on Fridays, I have to do a thorough cleaning because the building remains closed on the weekends. The security guard Kevin was a 57-year-old man. He was a nice person. As I reached the entrance, I saw Kevin sitting behind the counter with the same friendly smile. You ready to enjoy the weekend, Anna? He said in a jovial tone. Of course, Kevin. But my weekend starts at 10 p.m. after I finish this cleaning here, I said. Kevin nodded his head and said, You're a good mother, Anna. How's our little angel doing? Kevin referred to my daughter as a little angel, which often put a smile on my face. She's doing well. Tomorrow I'm going to take her to the fair. She's excited, you know. I replied while pressing the elevator button. Kevin smiled and said, That sounds like fun. Well, I'll see you at 10 again. The elevator came down and I got inside with the dumpster, waving him goodbye. I started to arrange my cart. I was used to being alone in the empty building night after night. Never once I felt uncomfortable or scared in any way. The elevator door opened on the first floor. I came out and started to walk towards the washroom with my cart. I opened the washroom door and vacated the waste onto my bin. Time went on as I reached one floor after the other and collected the trash. When I finished with the fourth floor and pressed the elevator button to move on to the next one, something really weird happened. As soon as the lift door opened, a disgusting smell of burnt tobacco filled my nostrils. It felt like someone smoked in the elevator. I became surprised because there's no one in the entire building except myself and Kevin. And also, if someone had to use the elevator, they must get up from the ground floor, which will result in the sound of the elevator moving downstairs. 
I heard no such sounds with my one button press. The elevator door opened in a wink. This clarifies that the elevator was standing on the fourth floor the entire time. The hair on the back of my neck stuck up. I looked around and a feeling of fear grabbed me instantly. I said in a loud voice, Is anybody in here? Hello? Is someone here? I never realized before how silence could be absolutely terrifying. I stood there staring at the entire floor. There was no sound. I then thought it might be a trick that my mind was playing on me. I got inside the elevator and pressed floor number 5. While the elevator was going upstairs, I couldn't help but think about what just happened a few moments back. The elevator opened on the 5th floor and I got busy again. I increased my speed because I don't know why, but I had this feeling of anxiety and just wanted to get off work as soon as possible. After two hours of hard labor, I managed to finish all the floors and it was time to get down and leave for home. I switched off the washroom light on the 10th floor and started to walk towards the elevator. Suddenly, I felt like I was being followed. I turned around really quick and saw the long empty corridor lying behind. Damn it! What the hell is wrong with your mind today, Anna? I said to myself. I then turned back and started to walk faster. The moment I reached the elevator and went to close the door, I heard a voice. Please, please help me. I, I can't take this pain anymore. It was a man's voice. I could tell he was in terrible pain. I said, Who are you? Is everything alright? The man replied, Help me. I can't walk. My leg, it hurts. I became confused about what to do. I came out and followed his voice. Where are you? The man replied. Right at this corner. Please, help me. I realized the voice was coming to form at the end of the corridor. I walked thinking that there was someone who needed my help. I was almost halfway when my cell phone rang. It was Kevin. I took the call and said, Kevin, I, I think there's someone stuck here. Can you... But before I could finish, I heard Kevin saying, Anna, listen to me carefully. You must come down. Leave everything and just hop back onto the elevator. The cops are going to be here soon. Why? What's wrong? I said in a confused voice. I just saw some creep walking on the 10th floor corridor with a bloody knife. I've called 911 and they think it's the same serial killer that escaped from the prison today. My heart dropped into my stomach. I almost screamed, saying, What? Just then, my eyes went to the end of the corridor. I saw a tall, bony guy standing there and watching me. His stare made my entrails scream in horror. I have never seen such a demonic face. His eyes were like a vulture, and I realized he was trying to lure me into his trap a few moments back. The man said, <laughs> Hello there. I'm glad we finally met. I screamed at the top of my lungs and ran towards the elevator. The man was chasing me like a hungry wolf, but before he could catch me, I bolted inside the elevator. I started pressing the button to close the elevator door. The man was running towards me. I knew if he caught me, the cops will find nothing but my dead body. I pressed the button repeatedly. All I wanted was the elevator door to close. The man was just a few inches away from the door when it began to close. The man stopped and said with a terrifying grin, I'll see you downstairs. And then I saw him rush towards the emergency stairs. Now, the horror went to a horrifying level. The elevator started to go down. I was paranoid like hell because now the man would be waiting for me in front of the elevator door. In those few seconds, I could see my entire life flashing right in front of my eyes. I was sobbing and crying. I was sure I was going to die at the end of this serial killer as soon as the elevator hit the ninth floor. Suddenly, an idea came to mind. I pressed the stop button immediately and the elevator stopped right before reaching the ninth floor. I thought, if I just wait for a few moments, the cops will be here in time, and this is probably the only way I can save my life. The elevator stood silently. There was no sound except for my madly beating heart. I tried to listen carefully to see if the man was still out there or not. I could tell from the ray of light that the bottom half of the elevator was already standing on the ninth floor. The security alarm went on and I heard Kevin's voice in the microphone. Anna, just wait a few minutes more. 
The cops are almost here. Be tough. No matter what you do, do not come out of the elevator. I don't want to scare you, but the man is standing right in front of the elevator. My head started to throb. I felt like I was going to faint on the floor out of fear. I screamed. Why are you doing this? The man on the other side replied. I'd like to feel your skin on me after I peel it off from your body with my sharp knife, Anna. I screamed back, saying, I am not coming out of this elevator, and the cops are going to be here soon. Burn in hell, you freak! Suddenly, the elevator microphone buzzed again, and I heard Kevin's voice. The cops are going up, Anna. They'll be on the ninth floor soon. Don't worry, it'll all be over now. Everything went quiet. No reply came from outside. I got close to the elevator door and leaned on it to hear if he was still out there or not. I tried to listen when suddenly a huge knife sprung in between the gap of the elevator door, almost slicing my feet. I got cut bad, but thank God it wasn't that severe. Looks like I missed this time, Anna, but I won't miss the next time. Just remember my words. <laughs> Then the man's running footsteps faded away. When the cops opened the elevator, they found me lying on the floor unconscious. They're still looking for the serial killer. I like going for a run after dinner every night. When I was in college, I was popular as the bravest boy in our gang. I've always been the risk taker, adventurous type. I live in a small town, and after my parents' death, I inherited their house. I created an office space for myself. I'm a professional gamer and I write for a few tech websites. I was completely satisfied with my life until this happened. It was a warm Monday night. After dwelling with huge work pressure, I was dying to go out for a jog. As soon as I finished my dinner, I changed into my running clothes and started on the road. The area where I live is close to an abandoned factory site with dusty roads leading to the woods. After running for five to seven minutes, I reached in front of the abandoned factory and stopped. I remembered my father telling me creepy stories about this factory. Many people in our town used to say this factory had a hidden space to run weird experiments. But one day, a fire broke out, and the entire place burned down. Since then, this plot has been an abandoned location. I watched the black, broken structure attentively. It still risks me to think some crazy people ran experiments here. I shrugged it off eventually and started to run again. I decided to make a round through the area surrounding this factory. This way I will cover up a pretty big lap and also going in a circle will help me find my way back home. I looked at my watch and saw it was 10.30 at night. The factory stood right in the middle of the ground. When I came closer to the entrance gate of the factory, I heard a noise. At first, I failed to spot it out, but the more I got to the entrance, the louder the sound got. It was the scream of a woman. My heart stopped right at that second. Did I hear that correctly? But before I could contemplate on that thought, the scream took place again. I turned to the factory immediately. The broken windows and shattered glass signified it had been abandoned for a long time. After a lot of hesitation, I started to walk towards the entrance. The weed-covered ground made it difficult to walk. The sound of wind and crickets chirping nearby gave me serious horror movie vibes. As I stood in front of the main door of the factory, something at the back of my mind kept telling me that I shouldn't be here. I pushed the half-broken door and tiptoed inside the building. A large, empty hall stood in front of me. The floor was covered with dust and all kinds of dirt. At the end of the hall, I saw an iron stairway leading to the top floor, but the entire place seemed out of use. I was wondering if I should be going upstairs or not, just when I saw a thin ray of light coming from the floor under the staircase. All this time, I didn't notice it. I carefully walked to the area of the floor. I saw a square lid was placed on the floor. I could easily understand that this lid is nothing but a doorway to the basement area. Now, I have heard enough weird stories about the experiments that used to take place under this factory. I even heard about a secret lab residing under this property. I got down on my hands and knees and lifted the lid to peek inside. I wanted to know what was happening down there. What I saw terrified me for life. 
There were six to seven people dressed weirdly. They were standing surrounding a cage, and inside the cage stood a gigantic evil creature. Its entire body was black, but its eyes were like lightning bolts. The lights I saw earlier were coming from its huge, bright eyes. The creature kept screaming in a squeaky voice, and the men tried to keep him contained in that cage. Suddenly, my phone rang and the creature looked right at me. I felt like I just went blind for a few seconds. A man said, Don't look at the eyes! You must never look at the eyes of SCP-15! I got up and started to run for my life. It took me some time to adjust my vision, but I didn't stop. When I reached home, I got inside and closed the door right behind me. Since that night, I started to experience some weird changes in myself. No matter how much I ate or worked out, I kept losing weight rapidly. My neighbor, Mrs. Sherman, got shocked seeing me one day. Oh my god, Jeremy! Are you suffering from a serious illness? No, I, I have no idea, Mrs. Sherman, I said in a feeble voice. I went to my family doctor and many other doctors as well, but no one was able to detect what was happening to me. One night, I was sitting in my kitchen having dinner. Suddenly, I saw a black shadow moving in my backyard. My stomach dropped in fear. The door leading to the backyard is right beside my kitchen area. The black shadow rushed towards the door and I saw the doorknob twisting on its own. I ran to hold the door to prevent whoever was trying to get inside. I almost slammed on the door and as I looked to the window, a pair of floodlights flashed behind the glass window. It was the same creature I saw that night under the abandoned factory. I was standing face to face with this devil. The only obstacle between us was my wooden door. I knew the door was nothing to this giant. How could he have just followed me? I screamed for help, but there was no one to hear my cry. The dark, evil giant then banged hard on the door. I got pushed with a huge force and fell on the floor. The door broke down in front of my eyes. SCP-15 stood right in front of me. It opened its huge mouth. I saw sharp yellow teeth flashing inside its huge jaw. I screamed because I knew this is probably the last scream of my life and then fainted on the ground. I woke up in a hospital bed two days after the incident. I was shocked to find myself alive. I asked the doctor if anyone found the creature that attacked me. She looked at me with mysterious eyes. What do you think happened to you, Mr. Smith? Convincingly, I said. I was attacked! That devil attacked me! Didn't any of you see him? He has huge, bright eyes! God, his eyes! The doctor said. Calm down, Jeremy. You were found unconscious in your house. There were signs of a break-in at your back door. Your neighbor came to see you and thought you had been robbed and beaten. That's why they brought you here. Don't you remember any of that? My eyes stunned in fear. I looked at the window and said, That means... That means he's still out there. My name's Robin. I work as a wildlife photographer. My job takes me to various places and I can hardly be in touch with my family. I grew up in Canada. My parents are still living there. I was very little when they sent me to live with my grandfather. I fell ill suddenly and my grandpa took me over. Since then, I have never been to my childhood home. My parents often came to visit me. One summer, I decided to visit them. I took a month off from work and decided to spend some time with my parents and explore my birthplace in Canada. I called my mom and told her I'll be staying with them during this trip. My mom's voice lit up in joy. I could tell how excited she was just by her voice. I packed my bags and took a flight. My dad came to pick me up at the airport. Seeing him after a long time melted my heart. I hugged him and said, Oh, I missed you, Dad. My dad smiled and said, I missed you too. Now come on, let's go, your mom is waiting. 
She has all of your favorite dishes cooked. We got inside the car, and the entire way we kept chatting. After 20 minutes of the drive, the car stopped in front of a tall residential building. I got down and looked at it for a while. God, this building is still the same, I said. I was feeling nostalgic. Even though my childhood memories regarding this place are now in fragments, I was still awestruck. My dad patted my back and said, Welcome home, son. I grabbed my backpack and entered the ground floor of the building. It was a long corridor. Our apartment is on the eighth floor. I was about to get inside the elevator when my eyes went to the numbering plate. A small, uncleared memory flashed in front of my eyes. I remembered pressing those buttons when I was a child. I loved playing inside the elevators so much. I looked around and realized this elevator had been renovated. I looked at the ceiling of the elevator. There was a small vent on it for air circulation. From that vent, the hollow elevator shaft was visible. For a moment, I felt a pair of eyes were watching me from there. The hair on the back of my neck stood up immediately. Come on, we're here, my dad told me. I saw we were standing on the eighth floor. My dad asked, Something wrong, Robin? Sorry, it's nothing. I just got distracted, I replied. While coming out of the elevator, I looked up once again, but there wasn't anything. God, this hectic journey really got to me, I said to myself. After a cool, refreshing shower, I finally managed to clear out my mind. My mom made chicken, porridge, fried mushrooms, and my favorite cheesecake for dinner that night. It sure is good to be home, Mama, I said, with a big smile. We all sat down in the living room to chat. My dad was really funny. He started to bring all kinds of embarrassing childhood memories up. Everyone was laughing and having a good time. At around 11 p.m., we all went to bed. I was already tired and feeling very sleepy. As I laid down on my soft bed, deep sleep grabbed my eyes. At around 2 in the morning, I heard a weird sound in my room. It felt like someone was breathing heavily, sitting very close to me. I opened my eyes, and what I saw made my heart race like a wild horse. A face was leaning on me and breathing heavily. I could tell it was a little girl. Her long black hairs were floating in the air. All I could see was her wide eyes and that dark face. She was watching me while I slept all of this time. My voice got stuck. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. The girl then came closer and said, How could you? How could you, Robbie? I shot up from my bed, panting and gasping for air. The sunlight coming from my window made me realize that it was morning. I wiped the drops of sweat from my face and uttered to myself, What the hell? That dream felt so real. I didn't say anything to my mom or dad about this creepy dream. I freshened up and sat for breakfast. Casually, I asked, Hey mom, what did you used to call me when I was little? My mom replied, What kind of weird question is that, Robin? We all called you by your name. I smiled awkwardly and said, No, I, I just thought if someone called me Robbie or not. But before I could finish my sentence, I saw my mom's face changing color. She froze like a statue and said, Who told you that? Did anyone in the building call you Robbie? I looked at her with a confused face and said, No, but it means that someone used to call me Robbie, right? My dad suddenly looked at my mom and said, Don't you remember, Yasmin? I used to call him Robbie sometimes. My mom immediately smiled and said, Oh, right. Yeah, I, I must just be getting old. I felt the suppressed tension in the room. I didn't know why, but I was sure my parents were hiding something from me. After finishing my breakfast, I decided to go out and roam around. I got into the lift and my eyes went towards the elevator shaft, but I didn't see anything except the hollow place this time. That day, I roamed around the town. I saw my school and visited the kids' park. So many memories filled my heart with joy. At around 7.30 p.m., I went to a local pub to chill for some time. My mom called me in between and said, Robin, when are you coming home? I replied, Hey mom, yeah, I'm gonna be a little late tonight, but don't wait up for me. I'll just have dinner at the pub here. My mom replied, Okay, sweetie. Well, listen, your dad and I were thinking about visiting my sister tomorrow. Your aunt is dying to meet you. 
We'll leave for their farmhouse tomorrow, okay? Seems like a plan to me, I said. I watched a football game in the pub and drank as many beers as possible. When I came home, I was stumbling. <laughs> Shit, man. I really am drunk. I thought to myself. All I wanted then was to go to my room and sleep like a dead cat. I got inside the lift and pressed button 8. The lift started to go up. The number plate flashed. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. I was feeling suffocated and warm, so I took off my jacket and suddenly noticed the mirror on the lift's wall. The same girl from my dream last night was standing right beside me. The scariest thing was that I looked beside me, but there was no one inside the elevator except me. My skin crawled in terror. Who are you? What do you want from me? The girl looked at the elevator shaft and then said in the same painful voice, How could you, Robbie? How could you? She then opened her black, hollow mouth and a demonic scream numbed my ear. Suddenly, a drop of blood fell on my forehead and as I looked up, Drops of blood started to pour from the elevator shaft. The entire elevator was splattered with blood. The elevator started to go up at full speed. It passed my floor and the numbers flashed. 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 13th floor. I remembered. I remembered. Susie, it, it was Susie. Oh my god. Susie and I were best friends. We used to run all over the apartment during afternoons and play together. One day, the elevator was out of order. We were playing hide and seek with the other kids in the apartment. Susie and I decided to hide above the elevator. I helped her climb up and I went to go grab something to stand on so I could get up there as well. We had no idea that the maintenance guy was working in the basement on the elevator. As soon as he fixed it and pressed the button, the elevator went to the top floor at full speed. I remembered Susie's scream when she got crushed under the roof. All this time, she was telling me how could I leave her that day. My head started to throb in pain. I couldn't breathe. Eventually, I fainted on the floor. I was down with a high fever for two days. When I got a bit better, I confronted my parents. My mom cried a lot and said, oh, Robin, we sent you away so that you can keep this out of your vicious memory. Poor Susie. She kept on sobbing. I visited Susie's grave the other day. Her family buried her in our local graveyard and moved to Australia. Tears rolled down my cheeks. I murmured softly. Susie, I didn't leave you that day. I, I'm sorry I was late. I hope you rest in peace. My father had a knack for traveling. Whenever he got holidays, we went on short trips. I was probably eight years old back then. My father rented a small cottage in the woods. It was a farmhouse type of area with scattered cottages here and there. It was a secluded travel spot. Most campers and hikers came there. At that time, we were the only lodgers staying on that property. At least, that's what the owner told us. My dad parked his car near our cottage. There stood a big lake right in front of the cottage. It was a small wooden cottage with two small bedrooms and a living room. I was loving the place. My father took me to the middle of the lake on a boat. We did a bit of fishing. He rowed the boat for some time on the lake. I was enjoying the boat ride as it was my first time. My mom sat on the deck and kept smiling at us. I saw colorful birds flying over our head. The green woods surrounding the lake were moving slowly with the wind. Suddenly, I spotted a huge tree on my left. It felt like someone was standing under the tree and watching us. Who is that, Daddy? I asked my dad and pointed in that direction. Right that moment, I saw the person vanishing behind the tree. My dad didn't see anyone. We came back from the lake. My mother set up small table chairs. She brought lunch with her. We sat down and started to eat. My dad was drinking beer, and I was eating an egg sandwich sitting right next to him. We were laughing and having a good time. After lunch, I thought to roam around a bit. I started to walk around. Don't go too far, Mia! My mother yelled. I picked up a wooden stick from the ground and started to walk. 
I was staying close to the cottage, but suddenly I saw a rabbit running around at some distance. I was just a kid, hence, out of excitement, I started to follow the rabbit. The rabbit jumped into a nearby bush. I ran there and started to move the bush with my wooden stick. Suddenly, I heard rustling footsteps behind me. I turned back and saw an average height man standing with a weird smile. He was holding the rabbit on his lap. He twitched his eyebrows at me and said, Looking for this rabbit, dear? Do you want to pet this rabbit? Um, but mom says they always run away. They won't if you put them in a cage. <laughs> I scratched my head and said, But I don't have a cage. I have one at my place. If you come with me, I can give you that. I turned around and saw my parents sitting near the lake and talking on their own. They were far from me, so I couldn't ask for their permission. I looked at the man again. He was standing holding the bunny like before and smiling at me. I know that was a huge red flag, but I was just eight years old and I wanted that rabbit. Okay, let's go. I agreed to go with this man. The man's eyes sparkled mysteriously. He started to walk while showing me the way ahead. After about five to seven minutes, we came in front of a small cottage. This cottage looked the same as ours. I remembered the owner telling us that we were the only ones staying on this property. Hence, I was a bit surprised to see this man staying in another cottage. Come on with me. I followed him without asking any question. He pushed the main door and we got inside. As soon as I stepped inside the cottage, I smelled something really bad. It felt like something died in there. Sit here. I'll bring the cage for you. He handed me the rabbit and went to the room on his left. I sat on the couch quietly. The entire cabin was very messy and dirty. Muddy clothes were scattered all over the place. I was wondering how could someone live like this, just when the man spoke from the room. Can you come help me, dear? I got up and went to the room. The smell grew stronger this time. I realized that it was coming from this room only. The room was very dark. There was a window on my right side, and a torn, dirty rag was hanging from it. I guessed it to be the curtain. There were small holes on it, from which sunlight pierced inside the room. It took me some time to figure out that there's a bed in this room, and someone is lying on it. At first, I thought it must be that man. But then as my eyes adjusted with the darkness, I saw the man standing next to that bed and speaking to the person who was lying on it. See? I, I brought her. Look. She's standing there. Suddenly, the person lying on the bed started to get up. I could hear heavy breathing. Come here, dear. Come here. She's got so many candies for you. Come on. The man started to call me to get close to the bed but something didn't feel right anymore. I realized I shouldn't have come with this man. My mom must be worried for me. I, I better get back. As soon as I said that, I saw the man's facial expression change. He almost jumped on me and grabbed me. I started to scream. The man lifted me on his lap and said, Touch her, honey. She can take your disease away. Take her in your arms. Come on. I was throwing my hands and legs in the air while screaming for my life. The man started to take me close to that person lying on the bed. The reeking smell grew stronger each second. The man reached the end of the bed and I kicked him on the face while grabbing the curtain of the window. The man fell on the floor holding his bleeding nose. I fell on the floor as well and that entire curtain came off from the window. The room filled with sunlight and I saw a horrified looking woman sitting on her bed. Her face was rotten. Her skin was coming off. Blood and pus were all over her body. She looked like a living corpse. The disgusting smell from her body made me nauseous. I screamed at the top of my lungs. The woman started to crawl towards me. She stretched her bony, ugly hand to grab me. I screamed and moved back like prey in front of the predator. Suddenly, my father bolted inside of the room. Mia! Oh my god! He immediately ran towards me and grabbed me from the floor. The woman was panting and throwing her hands in the air. 
She was dying to touch me once. We immediately came outside the cottage, and I saw cop cars standing outside the cottage. I don't remember what exactly happened after my father took me out of that cottage. Probably I fainted. But the story unfolded, shocking the hell out of us. The man and the woman were escaped convicts. They broke out from prison and came into these woods to hide. While living in the wilderness, the woman was infected badly. She might have been bitten by some venomous insect, leaving her to rot like a corpse. The woman knew witchcraft, and this couple believed that if she could get an innocent child, she can get better again. They thought to run a ritual by placing a child onto her lap. By touching this child, she wanted to transfer her disease to a different body. This is why the man lured me into the house. The paramedics took the woman to the hospital, where she died within a week. The man was sent back to prison with another charge of attempted abduction. I still can't get rid of the image of that sick woman crawling towards me like a corpse and stretching her rotten hand to grab me. I do not go on trips that include forests or cottages anymore. I am a foster mom. I've been running this small foster home for six years now. I grew up as an orphan. Hence, I feel bad for every kid who is left to live without parental care. A friend of mine runs an NGO that helps these foster kids to get adopted to a loving, caring family at times. My name is Michelle, and this is a story of a new kid whom I just took under foster care. It was a Tuesday morning. I was making breakfast for my other kid, a nine-year-old girl who is also under my shelter. I was busy making pancakes when Jenny said from the other room, Mommy, your phone is ringing. Someone's calling you. I realized I left my mobile in a hurry in the bedroom, so I ran to get it. I was late, hence the call got disconnected before I could pick up. When I returned, I saw Jenny was all dressed to leave for school and waiting for breakfast. I quickly served her the pancake. Here you go, Jenny. I made your favorite. She smiled and started to eat them. Ten minutes later, her school bus arrived. I walked her to the bus and she waved me goodbye. I was about to enter when my phone rang again. This time, I rushed to pick it up. It was my friend Kate who runs the NGO. Hey Kate, sorry I couldn't take your call earlier. Jenny just left for school. No problem. Listen, there's a boy about to arrive in our NGO. He's seven years old and unfortunately recently lost his parents in a plane crash. The boy has an uncle working overseas, so there's a chance he might go up for adoption. But, until that happens, I want you to take care of him. I'll come by with the lawyer and other legal papers tomorrow, and also drop off the kid to your house. Is that okay? Oh, sure. Tomorrow evening I'm free. Tomorrow evening it is then. See you. After the phone call, I went to buy some groceries for tomorrow's dinner. I felt emotional thinking about this poor little child who just lost his parents. I wanted to give him a warm welcome, so I decided to cook something nice. I bought some good quality meat, some fresh veggies, sweets, and chocolate. When Jenny came back from school, I sat her down and said, Jenny, tomorrow we are going to have another member in this house. A little boy will come and live with us. Jenny got so excited and said, Wow, I can have a little brother now. I smiled and hugged her for being such a sweet girl. The next day, Jenny and I decorated the entire house with balloons and colorful paper chains. At around 7 p.m., the doorbell rang. Jenny rushed towards the door and opened it with a big smile. Kate was standing there with a small, blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy, and beside them stood a man in his late 50s. I guessed him to be the lawyer of the boy. Please, come on in, I said with joy. They all came and sat down in the living room. Kate looked at Jenny and said, You're becoming such a pretty girl. Jenny blushed in happiness. She then looked at the little boy and said, You're my little brother, right? We all laughed hearing her adorable words, except the little boy. He sat down like a robot, didn't talk, didn't smile, even for once. Kate said, Luke, say hi to your sister. This is going to be your home now. You'll be very happy here. Luke looked at me and said in a lifeless voice, Who is she? Oh, that's Michelle. She's going to be your best friend from now on, Kate replied. I smiled at him, but he kept staring at me lifelessly. 
His face was so blank that after some time, a stare started to make me feel weird. We all discussed the legal terms and condition, and the details of this procedure. It was good to know that Luke's parents have left him enough money to have a sustainable life ahead. He can go to college and avail all the opportunities without any disturbance. When Kate was leaving, she bid Luke goodbye. Luke didn't go to hug her once. He stood there some time while Kate got into the car and then went back to the couch in the living room. I slowly went and sat beside him. I knew how much trauma this kid had gone through, so I said in a soft voice, Luke, do you want to get some ice cream? He kept his head down and didn't answer. Jenny said, Maybe he's tired, Mommy. I smiled and said, I guess you're right. You keep watching, Luke. I'll go make your bed. I heard Luke asking her, Is she your real mom? Jenny smiled and said, No, but I like calling her my mommy. She's nice. She's going to take good care of us. I prepared their beds. I arranged a bunk bed for both of them. Jenny slept on the upper bunk, and I tucked in Luke in the lower bunk. I kissed them goodnight, and Luke turned to the other side of the wall. I went to my room and lied down in the bed. I don't remember the exact time, but I woke up with a strange feeling. With my sleepy eyes, I saw Luke standing right in front of me and breathing heavily. The entire room was in complete darkness. I thought he might be feeling sick, so I turned on the bedside lamp and almost screamed in fear. Luke was standing there, looking at me, except his eyeballs were pale white. I don't know how, but his eyes were turned upside down, revealing the pale white part. I spoke in a fumbled voice. Luke? What, what happened to you? He blinked once. My mom is calling me. She's waiting for me in that blue house. My mom. She keeps calling for me. I picked him up from the ground, shouting, Jenny! Jenny! Jenny came running. What happened, Mommy? Call Aunt Kate right now! Please, just call her! Jenny called Kate, but she didn't answer the call. I put Luke on the bed. I got so scared that I couldn't sleep the entire night. Jenny also remained awake with me the whole time. The next morning when Luke woke up, I asked him, Do you remember what happened last night? Luke stared at me, not saying a word. Kate came to see him within some hours after receiving my message. She sat him down and said, Luke, sweetie, you have to understand that your mom and dad are in heaven now. They're watching you from there. Unfortunately, they can't come here. She wasn't my real mom. We were all shocked to hear this little boy say such a weird thing. Kate and I exchanged a surprised look. Sweetie, what are you saying? She was your mom. She loved you. My mom is in that blue house. She's waiting for me there. Can you please take me there? None of us was getting what was going on with this child. Out of curiosity, I asked, Do you know where this blue house is? Luke replied, Yeah, I can take you there. What happened next was beyond our expectation. Kate and I thought the best way to help this child would be to do what he says. He probably wants us to go outside. Children can do weird things for weird reasons sometimes. So, we all hopped into my car and I started the engine. Luke sat right beside me and said, Take the first left. Trust me guys, he gave me directions like an adult for at least half an hour. And beyond our imagination after taking the last right turn, we came near a huge lake. On the side of that lake stood a small wooden blue house. We got out of the car and walked towards the main door. Kate knocked on the door twice. We heard slow footsteps inside the house. Within a few seconds, an old woman opened the door. She looked quite like my granny. With surprised eyes, she noticed all of us and said, Who are you all? Did you make my favorite bread pudding, Mama? The old woman immediately looked at him and started to sob terribly. She hugged him to her chest and kept crying for hours. We came to know that later, the woman had a son who was in the army. The son often came during holidays to visit her. One morning, she got the news from the army general that her son died like a hero in the war two days earlier. His name was Sam. Sam died on the 21st of December, on the same day Luke was born. It might seem like a weird coincidence, but every time Sam came to visit his mom, the first thing he would say was, Did you make my favorite bread pudding, Mama? And hug the poor old woman. 
Luke roamed around the house, telling us very unnatural details which only a member of that house could know. And the even more terrifying thing is that the old woman showed us her son's childhood picture. It was none other than Luke. I work in an IKEA store as a general manager. I started as a salesman, but later got promoted for my good reputation and hard work. There are all kinds of buyers in this world. I have faced many weird as well as temperamental customers, but my balancing nature always helped in dealing with all kinds of individuals, until I met this one particular woman. Generally, our store hours run from 9am to 10pm every day. I like my job, so I have no complaints regarding the work pressure on weekends. Anyway, it was a Thursday, probably around 8pm. I was sitting near the counter and making a list of required deliveries on the computer. There are currently two salesmen in our shop, Sophie and Justin. Both of them were busy demonstrating to a few customers, just when the store door opened and a woman entered. I looked and saw a petite, average height woman standing near the entrance. She looked around the entire store cluelessly and then looked at me. Our eyes met and she smiled at me. She then slowly walked towards a pair of couches kept on her right side. I got busy again at work. Even though I was typing on the computer, I couldn't help but notice her from time to time. First, she started at those couches for a few seconds, and then touched one of its leather covers. Surprisingly, she nodded her head and said, no. The couches stood at a close distance from the counter, so I could hear her saying no quite perfectly. I thought she would ponder more in the couch section, but she didn't. She went straight to the bedding corners and started to check mattresses this time. After checking two to three options, she again nodded her head and said no. Even though I couldn't hear her this time, I guessed the reaction from her lip movement. She then walked to the cupboard corner and started to look at them with deep concentration. Well, I guess Ikea can get you all confused when it comes to buying furniture. I murmured to myself. I finally shrugged off her weird behavior and paid attention to typing the list. Not everyone who comes into the store is obligated to buy things, you know, so I thought if she needs help, she'll ask on her own. A few more minutes passed and I was just about to mail the list to the provider, when my eyes went on the dashboard of my counter and I almost screamed in fear. There was a pale, bony hand resting on it. I looked up and saw the same woman was standing at the counter and staring at me with an expressionless face. Hello? How can I help you, ma'am? Yes, I need some guidance on buying a... She looked at those couches again and stopped talking. Are you looking for couches? She didn't answer me. She just kept looking at the couches and then started to whisper. No, don't. Don't do that. Ma'am, is everything all right? Ma'am? I almost shouted. She looked at me with nervous eyes and said, Yes, um, I'm terribly sorry. My husband keeps interrupting me. Now, it was 9pm, and the store started to become empty. Justin already left early that day, so there was only Sophie and myself. I looked around and saw she wasn't there. At that moment, it was just me and this weird woman in the store. I looked everywhere and said in a confused voice, Um, your husband? Yes, he's not in a happy mood today, but he'll be fine once I find something good for him. And then smiled in a very unnatural way. When the woman entered, I saw her alone, and since then customers left the store, and no one has gone inside so far. I stood near the entrance so no one could avoid my watch while entering this IKEA store. I said, but ma'am, I don't see your husband anywhere. Are you sure everything's all right? She suddenly turned pale and said, What do you mean you don't see him? He's standing right behind you. The hair on the back of my neck stood up in fear. I couldn't decide on my next move. Should I be calling for Sophie out loud or just turn my back? The woman looked over my shoulder and said, No, don't! I couldn't stop myself anymore. I bolted out from that counter. Sophie, where are you? I screamed frantically. There was no one at the counter, but I was still shivering in an unknown fear. The woman started to whisper in a low voice. Just tell me what you want, Sam, and I will get it for you. And then you must leave me alone. Do you get it, Sam? 
Sophie came rushing out of the washroom, hearing my scream, and said, What in the hell is going on here? I pointed towards the woman and said, She's saying some crazy shit and behaving even crazier. Sophie and I stood to the side while watching this woman ranting and whispering to the wind. The woman then looked right at us and said, Please tell him to leave me now. I'm tired of doing this every day. Then started to cry like a child. <laughs> Sophie got close to her and said, Tell whom, ma'am? Who are you talking to? She screamed like a lunatic. My dead husband! He keeps coming back! Sophie and I both froze in fear. Suddenly, the woman grabbed Sophie's hand and started whispering, No, no, please. I ran to the counter to call the cops, seeing things going out of hand, just when the store lights started flickering. Sophie screamed and freed her to run to the door. I too ran with her as the woman started to vomit on the floor. We were both extremely scared and out of rational explanations. The furniture at the store started to swing in the air and collide with each other, making loud thuds. Some of these furnitures even broke into pieces due to these supernatural occurrences. As soon as Sophie and I came out of the store, the entrance door shut behind us. We banged on it and tried to open it, but nothing helped. The woman kept vomiting on the floor as the lights flickered and furniture rattled against each other. Suddenly, the lights went off and all the sound stopped. We were both panting in fear. With my trembling hand, I called 911. We tried to open the door once again, and surprisingly, it opened this time. The store was in complete darkness, hence none of us could figure out a single thing in the dark. Sophie and I were walking side by side, when we both almost slipped on the floor. Ah, shit. What was under my feet? Sophie said. I too felt that the floor had become slippery. I thought maybe we had stepped on the vomit, and I turned on the flashlight on my phone, only to witness something that I will never be able to forget about. The woman was lying dead on the floor. Her face was staring at us, her eyes were wide and coming out of the eye sockets, and there were blood drops on her lips. We realized that she had vomited blood this entire time, but this is not the only scary part we came across. The woman was being dragged on the blood and left in the middle of the store. We could see a trail of blood splattered on the floor in a straight line. The cops came and they inspected the entire store and talked to all of us and the customers who visited the shop that day. The paramedics declared this woman was suffering from an illness, which is why she vomited blood and later died out of a heart attack. But the only question that haunts me to sleep is, she was completely alone in the store when the supernatural occurrences took place, because Sophie and I already ran outside. No one was inside except her. Then, who dragged her body to the middle of the store after she died? I'm trying to get more information on this woman. I want to know what happened to her husband, if there was any. I promise to let you know once I get a hold of that. Till then, stay safe. I'm a scientist. The idea of how life took place on our planet has always thrilled me. I was studying microbiology at a university in California. In my final years, I applied to work as a research intern in an experimental facility. The institute kept a low profile, but as I started working there, I realized that there was something they were trying to hide from us. My friend Emily and I were both working as interns. We helped researchers in the lab and got a good stipend in return. The learning opportunities were nice too. One day, Emily and I were having lunch in the cafeteria. Trust me, Christy, this place is boring. We should have taken the internship offered by our senior. I mean, he was good looking too, she said while laughing. I replied, come on, stop fooling around so much. I like it here. Emily rolled her eyes and said, that's because you're boring too. We've been friends since the first day of college, so I never cared when she made fun of me, because these things happen between friends. We were chatting and munching on our food when suddenly we overheard a conversation. Okay, we prepared the room for the specimen. You can tell them to bring it here tonight after everyone leaves. I followed the voice and saw two men standing near the table close to us, talking with serious faces. As I noticed the guy who just spoke, 
Our eyes met accidentally. He looked up at me and smiled. Ooh, I think someone likes you, Emily said in a funny voice. Shut up! Eat your food, I replied awkwardly. I looked away immediately and started eating quietly. Within 10 to 15 seconds, the guy came to me and said, Hi, I'm Damien. I'm a junior researcher here. Emily said, Hey, we're working as interns. Nice to meet you, I'm Emily. The guy smiled at her and then said to me, And what's your name? I awkwardly looked at him and said, I'm Christy. Damien smiled and said, Well, Christy, it's nice to meet you. I'll see you around. Oh my god, he is so crushing on you, Emily said. I couldn't help but smile this time. Damien was quite handsome, and since then, we started to get close. And then he asked for my number. We went on a couple of dates, and things were fun whenever we were together. Apart from that, he helped me with my work. I soon realized that he was very passionate about his work as well. His sense of knowledge and wit overwhelmed me many times. One afternoon, I was heading to Lab 203 when I saw Damien standing in the corridor talking to a security guard. As I got closer, I heard him saying, Always check the lock on the door. We all need to be highly cautious about SCP-096. Specimens in any research labs are often titled with certain code names. So, at first, it didn't surprise me. But, on our way home, out of curiosity, I asked him, What is SCP-096? Now, Damien has always been a careful driver, but that moment, he pressed the brake accidentally. The car jerked and we stopped in the middle of the road. People started honking horns behind us. We could have been hit by some running car too, but luckily, nothing dangerous happened. What in the hell was that? I screamed in fear. Damien said in a hesitated voice, I'm sorry, Christy, I just got distracted. On the entire way, we didn't say a single thing to each other. I stayed back at his place that night. It surprised me that Damien didn't even mention SCP-096, irrespective of me asking about it. Something kept telling me that he was hiding information about this specimen. The next morning we went to work, and I asked him again. Um, you didn't tell me what this SCP-096... Damien smiled as if he completely forgot this entire event, but I could tell that he was being fake. He then said, you know, we sometimes bring various subjects for our research works. This is one of a kind. It's like a microorganism. Really? Can you include me in this research process? It'll add some extra credits for my specialization paper, I said. Damien's face turned pale, and he said in a fumbled voice, Um, uh, okay, uh, I have to ask my seniors, though. Let's see if I can do something about it. So far, whenever I showed interest in a certain project, Damien always included me in that, or at least let me visit the lab room of research so that I can learn for myself, but his mixed reaction disappointed me this time. That day, Damien avoided me and didn't even come for lunch. Emily said, Seems like you guys are having your first couple fights, huh? I exhaled in disappointment and said, I don't know. Since I asked him about the specimen, his behavior changed surprisingly. What specimen? Emily asked. I'm not sure. I overheard him warning a security guard about some SCP-96. I replied, Huh. I also heard people talking that there was something secret kept inside a lab in the basement. Emily said, They have a lab in the basement? I asked. Yeah. And some interns told me it's the most mysterious part of this facility. Except for some special researchers, no one's allowed to go in there. Emily replied, I started to think if SCP-96 was just a microorganism, then why is there so much hush-hush about it? Suddenly, an idea came to my mind. Emily and I decided to check the Three Stored Research Institute, just to find if there's a lab kept separately for this mysterious specimen. But, obviously, we didn't find any such room. I got sure that whatever this is, it's kept in the lab located in the basement. I came home from work and went to take a shower. When I came back, I saw three missed calls on my phone. It was Damien. I called him back and he apologized. 
He then came over to my place and we had dinner and things got back to normal, but I had some other plans made already. Emily and I decided to sneak into the facility at around midnight. I knew Damien carries the keys of the lab and main entrance with him all the time. After he fell asleep, I secretly took the keys and informed Emily that I was on my way. All I wanted to know was what the hell SCP-96 was. When we reached the Institute, it stood like a haunted place. The pale moonlight and crickets chirping nearby made it even more spooky. We got inside the gates very carefully. We didn't want to attract any kind of unwanted attention. After opening the main gate, we walked towards the basement door. The door stood locked with chains and a metal lock. After two to three attempts of using various keys, we finally managed to unlock it. As soon as we came down the basement stairs, we realized why everyone was so secretive about this part of the research facility. There was a long corridor, and believe me, there was only one room standing at the end of the corridor. The door of the room had a big caution sign, and under that, a nameplate read, SCP-96, the shy guy. It's just some guy? Emily said in a shocking tone. I was shocked too. Damien told me it was some kind of microorganism, but what the hell is going on here? <laughs> Suddenly, we heard a crying sound coming from that room. We rushed over and Emily said, Hey, are you alright? But no one replied. Only a sobbing voice kept whimpering in pain. Out of disgust and annoyance at the cruel work culture of this facility, I started unlocking the door. I twisted the key and a blue button started to blink right above the door. I was about to press it when Emily stopped me for a second and said, Christy, I don't know if this is a good idea. I replied, They're running God knows what kind of insane experiments on a poor human being. So yeah, I think it is a good idea to unlock the door and set him free. Without hesitating anymore, I pressed the button and a huge alarm went off. I realized that I needed to take the key out before pressing the button. It was a clever move to avoid security breaches. Suddenly, a screaming voice appeared behind my back. No, Christy, what have you done? I turned around and saw Damien standing in the corridor with a horrified face. The door opened and before I could understand more, I saw a long hand grasp my friend Emily and fling her into the air. She screamed in fear and fell on the floor, making a loud thud. Then, a creepy-looking human figure came out of that room. The humanoid creature had very little muscle mass, as it was suffering from acute malnourishment. Its arms were grossly out of proportion, making it look like nothing less than an alien. I screamed and started to run away. Emily got up and was limping behind me. I saw the creature coming at full speed towards Emily. I ran back to give her a hand, but before I reached out to her, the creature had gotten her. It then did something that I will never be able to forget for the rest of my life. It tore up Emily's hands and legs like a broken doll, and then started to devour her. I screamed and screamed, but the creature didn't stop. I heard it munching on my poor friend's flesh. Soon, a group of seven to eight guards rushed downstairs. Damien took me out and the guards tried to stop the creature from escaping the facility. I guess they were able to contain SCP-96 again. I will never be able to forgive myself for acting like a stupid kid who led her friend to die. Damien and I left the area as the research institute strictly informed us to go underground for a while. Emily's parents were told that she died in a lab accident. I was unable to lie to them so I left the town and my college. I haven't contacted my parents for a week now, and I don't know if I'll be able to. Even if I do, I have no idea what explanation I'll give them about my miserable life. Before starting the story, I would suggest you guys to go subscribe to the channel. It turns out that most of you guys who watch me aren't actually subscribed. So, if you like the content and want to support the channel, go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell. It's free, and you can always change your mind later. My girlfriend Rosie was a huge TikTok fan. Whenever we went somewhere, she never forgot to record a TikTok video. Rosie and I met in college. She was obsessed with social media. I often told her to keep some privacy, but she never listened to me. 
She loved the fake attention of people showering her with love on social media. Everything was going fine. Rosie was a happy, cheerful girl until she met a horrible accident. Rosie went for a long drive with her best friend Alice. I knew Alice for a long time. She was close with Rosie. They were driving on the highway at midnight. The car somehow lost control and Rosie could not control it. The car bumped onto a divider and turned over, crashing badly. Rosie made it out alive, but poor Alice suffered huge blood loss. If the paramedics were called in time, Alice could have been saved, but it was too late for her. When Rosie got back to her senses and called the paramedics, Alice lost a huge amount of blood. We all attended her funeral. Rosie turned into a completely different person. She hardly talked or went outside. I realized how traumatized she had become after losing her friend, but I couldn't see her like this, so I started to cheer her up in every way possible. One day Rosie was sitting near the window, watching the sunset. I went close to her and started filming her at TikTok. She looked at the camera and smiled casually. I uploaded the video from my TikTok account tagging her. People started commenting, so pretty, beautiful girl, and things like that. I thought at least these compliments would put a smile on her face. I took her out for dinner and then dropped her home. I came home and freshened up. When I came back from my room, a notification popped up. I checked my phone and saw that someone had commented in the TikTok video of Rosie. Out of curiosity, I opened the video to see the comment. A friend of mine had commented, Dude, your neighbor is creepy. I didn't understand what he meant. I replied to the comment saying, what are you saying, bro? Within 10 to 15 minutes, my friend replied, Look outside the window. He's watching your girlfriend. I played the video and looked closely near the window. I captured the video, keeping the sunset in front of Rosie. So, the camera recorded the outside view as well. As I watched closely, I noticed a tall man standing in the garden right in front of the window. Even though I couldn't see his face, but from his body posture... I could tell he was looking at Rosie. The locality where Rosie stays are quite a friendly neighborhood. She had been living there with her parents since childhood. I almost knew every person close to her house, but I didn't recognize this man at all. With more days passing, Rosie's health started to deteriorate. She started getting nightmares. She often woke up screaming in bed. Whenever I asked her, she said the tall man had come to get her. I decided to take her to a psychiatrist. I knew Alice's death left a deep impact on her mind. One evening, Rosie was staying home alone as her parents went to go see her grandmother. I went to stay with her. Leaving her alone for an entire night is not a good idea. I picked up some food from a nearby restaurant. I was walking towards Rosie's house. The area was empty. As soon as I got close to the house, I heard Rosie scream. I ran immediately and bolted inside the house. Rosie was sitting on the living room floor. Her face was pale white. She was sweating in terrible fear. Rosie, what happened? I fell asleep on the couch. Suddenly, I heard knocking on the glass window. As I opened my eyes, I saw... I saw... What? What, what did you see? Alice was standing outside of the window with that tall, bony man. Her face was horrible. They were... they were calling me. She then broke into tears. I calmed her down. After dinner, I tucked her into bed and sat beside her. She couldn't sleep, hence we started watching a movie. I was worried like hell. I had no idea who the hell this tall man was. Suddenly, I remembered that comment on my video. Rosie, did you see the video I took on TikTok that day? Yes. Why? Um... You didn't see the man standing inside your garden? What man are you talking about? I played the video once again and showed her. Rosie screamed in fear, saying, Oh my god, Mark! He's come to get me! Please! Please, Mark, don't let him take me! Please, I don't want to die! She started sobbing terribly. I got all freaked out. I said, What are you saying? Who are they? Please, Rosie, tell me everything. Rosie said in a fumbled voice, Alice and the tall man, 
They come to my dreams every night. They whisper in my ears. I asked, what do they whisper? Rosie looked around us as if someone was going to hear us, then said in a low voice, they said that I was supposed to die that day with Alice. It's not right that I live and started crying again. I hugged Rosie. I didn't know what to do or how to help my girlfriend from going mad because whatever she was telling me, none of it could be true. Maybe the guy in the video is just a guy from the street. How can I believe that her dead friend and a spooky tall man come to her dream and say all these creepy weird things? The next morning after her parents returned, I went straight to her psychiatrist. Dr. Millard was sitting in her chamber. She smiled at me and said, Please, sit down, Mark. What is it you want to talk about? Um, Dr. Millard, Rosie keeps telling me about this tall guy. What's happening to her? Dr. Millard said in a low voice, Look, Mark, I obviously don't have to tell you that somehow Rosie finds herself responsible for her friend Alice's death. So, as per my intuition, she is hallucinating the tall man as the Grim Reaper. She feels she should have died that day too. As she survived unexpectedly, the Grim Reaper is now behind her soul. So, you mean it's all in her imagination? How will she recover? She's losing her mind over this. Dr. Miller said, I would suggest you all take care of her and be with her until she expresses herself more to me. I can't make any conclusion now. I left the doctor's office in despair, but I was too late to stop the upcoming danger. I got a call from her mother. Mark, oh my god, Rosie's locked herself in her room. Please hurry. I jumped into my car and drove as fast as possible. As soon as I reached Rosie's house, I heard screams coming from the home. I ran inside the house and slammed the door hard. Rosie's mom screamed from upstairs. Mark, what's happening to my daughter? Please do something. I banged on Rosie's door. Rosie? Rosie, open the door. What are you doing? Rosie was sobbing in a painful voice. I didn't wait anymore because something in my heart kept telling me the danger is yet to come. I pushed the door hard and it broke down. We all saw Rosie sitting on her bed sobbing. She was looking to the corner of the room with wide, fearful eyes. But there was no one. She said, Please stop, you two. I can't take this anymore. She then looked at me and said, Mark, they're looking at me. They're calling me. Alice and the tall man. Can't you see them standing in the corner of the room? I saw nothing except darkness in the corner of the room. An idea sprung to mind. I took out my phone and started filming a video on the same TikTok filter, but didn't see anything. I stopped recording and said to Rosie, Rosie, there's no one inside this room. Come here. Come on. But Rosie stood up and took out a revolver under her pillow. Rosie's mom screamed, Rosie, what are you doing with your father's gun? Please, dear, don't do anything wrong. Stop this madness. And started crying. Rosie's father entered the house screaming. Rosie! But as soon as he came upstairs and saw Rosie pointing a gun at her head, he was numbed in fear. Rosie then looked at the dark corner and said, Mark, there's something you don't know. Alice had a crush on you. I, I got so jealous. I, I, knew I, I knew I didn't have to, but still... I couldn't stand her anymore. That day when the car turned over, I was conscious. She bled out in front of me, asking for help, but I didn't call the paramedics. I watched her bleed. I watched her die. I'm so sorry. I don't deserve this life. A loud gunshot took place, and blood splattered on the white wall above Rosie. I lost my girlfriend. Dr. Miller said it's the guilt in her subdued mind that led her to take this drastic step. But I still have that video I took at that moment. Believe me or not, as the camera pans in the room at the dark corner, I see a tall guy standing in there. And beside him, I see a blurred female face drenched in blood. My mother died from a drug overdose, and I never met my father. Eventually, I was put into foster care, 
and at that time I was 10 years old. I wasn't exactly a little kid, nor a teenager. I was extremely awkward, and being a girl child with no guardian to look after had perks of its own. The state put me into a foster home located on the outskirts of the city. The house belonged to a woman named Mona, who was in her late 40s. She ran the foster home with five kids, including me. Her boyfriend often came to visit her. I never quite liked the guy. He had a very rough face. There was a huge scar on his cheek, which signified he must have been in a horrible fight, because that was nothing but a knife scar. Anyways, Mona seemed fond of that guy. Whenever he came, she used to dress and make up a lot. They used to go out and return late at night. By the time they came back, we were all asleep. Among those kids, my only friend was my roommate Maria. Her mother left her on the road and she was put into foster care by an NGO. Every child who lived in that house had a tragic past to deal with. Mona was not a very affectionate person, but she never ill-treated any of us. She celebrated all of our birthdays on a particular day. This was probably her way of cutting the costs as much as possible. Our rooms were upstairs. Mona's bedroom was the biggest room in the house. She slept downstairs. I was playing with Maria in the backyard one day. She accidentally fell from the swing and hurt her leg. I went to call Mona and knocked on her bedroom door. As she opened the I noticed multicolored wallpaper stuck on the walls of her entire room. There were flowers and butterflies printed on them. I stood in awe seeing the grandeur of the room. Her room seemed like a different world altogether because of those vibrant wallpapers. She went to get Maria but I stood there and kept looking around. Mona got busy with Maria in the living room. I was taking a close look at the wallpaper when suddenly a woman whispered in my ear, Help me. I jumped back immediately out of shock. I looked around, but I was the only one standing in that room at the moment. I didn't understand. Was it all my imagination or did I really hear a woman's voice? Hello? Is there anybody here? I said nervously. No reply came back, but I started to hear a whispering sound. I concentrated on the sound and figured out it was coming from the bedroom wall right in front of me. I got closer and placed my ear on the wall. What are you doing? I turned around and saw Mona standing there and looking at me with a surprised face. N nothing. I was just watching the wallpaper. You have a beautiful room, Mona. I said. Well, thank you, sweetheart. Come on, let's go. It's time for lunch, she replied. Without wasting a single second more, I left the room with a very awkward face. I knew she saw me leaning on the wall and listening, like a crazy person. A few months passed. Two kids got adopted and it was only the three of us left in that house. Maria, a boy named Tony, and myself. Tony was younger than us. Hence, he always listened to us. One day, Mona was working in the kitchen, when suddenly, a leak took place under the kitchen sink. She called Marco for help. Marco came and started to check out the leak on the pipeline. I was sitting at the kitchen table and watching him work. Uh, I think there's a screw that needs to be tightened. Uh, shoot, I don't have a wrench, Marco said. I think there's one in the basement, Mona replied. None of the kids liked to go to the basement as it was dark and dingy, but Mona was busy and Marco was working as well, so I volunteered. I switched on the basement light and slowly went down the stairs. The basement had a funky smell, probably because it had no window or vent as such to let the air flow. On the right corner stood a wooden shelf. I saw the wrench sitting on the shelf. I walked to pick it up just when I noticed a big trunk in the left corner. I thought that there might be toys or something exciting in there, but as I got closer to the trunk, I noticed it was sealed with a metal lock. There's nothing but junk in it. My eyes followed the voice, and I saw Marco coming down the stairs of the basement. Then why is it locked? I asked curiously. Marco watched me for a moment, and then walked to the shelf and picked up the wrench. Come on, let's go. We got what we were looking for, he said. I came out of the basement and he locked the door behind me. I'm not sure, but since that day I started to realize that there was something wrong with this place. At night I could hear voices running through the halls, but the more I tried to listen, 
the more they faded away. One night, I got up from my bed hearing a quarrel downstairs. I tiptoed from my room and peeked from upstairs. I saw Mona and Marco were having a serious argument, but they were speaking in a rough, low voice. <laughs> what are you saying? Are you out of your mind? Look, I'm telling you, this kid will get us in trouble. Don't talk like an idiot. She's just a dumb kid. She'll never be able to guess the truth. She asked me what was in the trunk today. We have to get rid of it. Oh, come on. Did you chicken out because of a kid? Don't you remember how fooled the cops in California were? Listen, darling, there's nothing to worry about, okay? Just relax. I will keep the basement locked at all times from now on. Happy? <sighs> yeah, that'll be better. I'll look for a place to get rid of the trunk soon. They went to their bedroom and I returned to my bed. What could be inside of that trunk? I kept thinking. From that day, Mona always kept the basement door locked, but they couldn't keep the mystery hidden for long. It was a Saturday night. Mona and Marco were out. Tony, Maria, and I were watching TV in the living room. Hey, let's play hide and seek, Maria suddenly said. Tony and I agreed, and we started the game. After a few turns of play, it was my turn to find everyone. Ready or not, here I come. I rushed upstairs and started to look for Maria. I easily managed to find Tony as he hid under the bed, but Maria was nowhere to be found. I realized that she might have hidden downstairs. I rushed downstairs, and after checking the entire living room, the only place left to hide was Mona's bedroom, because the basement was already locked. I pushed the door of Mona's room and said, I know you're hiding in here somewhere, Maria. I smelled a strong chemical in Mona's room. The odor was coming from the walls. She sprayed something on the wallpaper, which made her room smell like hospital cabins. I walked close to the right wall and checked the vibrant wallpaper pasted on it. As I touched the wallpaper, it felt wet to me, and I became sure that there was a weird liquid applied all over. Suddenly, Maria came out of Mona's cupboard and tried to play a scary prank on me. As she went to grab my neck from behind, I turned around and skillfully dodged her, which resulted in her stumbling upon the wall. As soon as she fell onto the soggy wallpaper, she accidentally tore it, creating a hole. Hundreds of ants and spiders started to crawl out from that hole. It was clear that these insects lived underneath the wallpaper. We were absolutely terrified and came out of the house crying in fear. Our next door neighbor, Mr. Stewart, came rushing to our house. He got inside Mona's room and don't know why he immediately called the cops. Within 15 to 20 minutes, the cop cars came and we saw Mr. Stewart telling them something with a fearful face. The cops broke into the basement and a horrible truth moved us all. Mona and Marco were none other than convicted murderers who robbed and killed people in California. They murdered around six to seven people and magically found a way to hide the corpses. They escaped from California and came here to live in disguise. But the cops found out that the bones of those victims were kept in that trunk. They would never have been able to discover what happened to the victim's whole body if not for the day that Maria scratched those wallpapers accidentally. Yes, Mona and Marco skinned their victims and turned their skin into house wallpaper, but they were no professionals, hence they couldn't preserve the skin properly, which attracted insects. They were trying to drive the insects away by using chemicals, but they couldn't hide their grotesque crime. When the cops handcuffed Marco and Mona, I was standing at the house porch with Mariah and Tony. While walking towards the cop car, Marco looked at me and then to Mona. I told you that that kid would get us in trouble. I should have choked that bitch right in her sleep that day. I still can't forget his blood red eyes when he said how much he wanted to kill me that night. Now it all makes sense to me that that woman's voice from the wall, those whispers running around the house, but I can't tell these to anyone. I know that no one will believe me. I'm just lucky that I didn't end up in their trunk or his wallpaper on their wall. It's that time again. 
Morris looked at me with terrified eyes and spoke. Everyone in the room got silent immediately. The crackling sound of the wood burning in the fireplace created a spooky ambiance. John got up and went towards the bar. Rosie and I exchanged looks sitting on the living room couch. My husband, Morris, and I have invited our friends for dinner. John and Rosie had been our family friends for the last ten years. I looked at Morris and said, Don't you think you're overreacting? Morris opened the window in the living room. A gust of cold wind rushed inside the room. The winter nights in Oxfordshire are very cruel. Morris looked outside and stared at the dark valley for some time, then said in a low voice, We are the people of Tomby. Oxfordshire are struck with an ancient curse. None of us can deny that. Rosie said, But I agree with June. It's been a long time now. We should forget what happened 12 years back. I threw some wood in the fireplace and said, Morris, close the window. It's really cold, you know. Morris shut the window and sat on the bar. John poured him a glass of wine and said, Um, do you know how it all started? Rosie said in a sarcastic voice, Well, it would be fun to hear a spooky story on a chilly winter night, I think. I laughed and said, Yeah, a little story time won't hurt, I guess. Morris took a sip from his glass and looked at the burning fireplace. He kept staring at the fire for a while and said, It's scarier than any spooky story, because it is not a story. It is a true and terrifying incident that happened in this town 12 years earlier. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the poem, Crooked Man. There's a saying in our town that if you recite this poem out loud, you will be subjected to the curse of the Crooked Man. The origin of this poem started from a small house on the outskirts of our town. There lived a man, but no one recalls his name. Everyone addressed him as the Crooked Man. He had a broken back with twisted, broken legs. Out of sorrow and torture of the village people, he committed suicide one day. When the village people broke into the house, they saw his body dangling from a rope tied to his neck. His eyes were wide open, as if he was staring at all of them. Not just that. Some said that there was a wicked smile on his deadly pale face. His haunting spirit started to attack those who were living alone on a winter night. He used to enter their houses, breaking them into pieces, yet letting them live like a cripple. He's invincible. No one who saw him with naked eyes could ever speak a word. Many people died that year, and then suddenly, he stopped only to return after every 12 years. Since then, he rises from his death and haunts this town. Today is a day where he is supposed to seek revenge on this town. There's only two ways to know that he was there. In a muffled voice, Rose said, what are, what are those two ways? Morris looked at us and said, Whichever house he targets starts to get cracks on the walls and roof and from the body of his victims. In a serious voice, John said, Actually, my father also told me that this incident did happen. A crooked man haunts our village. I couldn't hold on to my laughter anymore. I almost cried while laughing loudly. <laughs> oh God, what's wrong with the brave men of our town? You can't be serious, come on. Rose said, Whatever it is, this story is really freaking me out. I wish I hadn't asked you to tell it in the first place. Morris said, June, my dear, there were people who thought like you until they became his victim or someone they know became one. We have to be prepared. There's no way one can defeat him. My grandfather told me if I hear him knock on the door, never answer it. I lost my calm this time. I got up and said, Fine, I will recite the poem out loud right now and I will show you that this is all a made up story and nothing else. Everyone got up in shock. Morris said, No, June. You shouldn't say his name out loud. It's a curse. I started to recite the poem out loud. There was a crooked man, and he walked a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence and a crooked style. He bought a crooked cat, which caught a crooked mouse, and they all lived together 
in a crooked little house. Did anything happen? I said after finishing the poem. Morris was looking at the door, frightened. Rose was almost about to cry. John was trying to listen carefully if anyone was walking to the door. But nothing happened. I sat down and said, See, I told you. Just a spooky story. Now come on, let's have dinner. At dinner, everyone started to ease up about this story, but my husband didn't say a single word to me. It made me worry that I might have gone too far with my joke today, but I wanted to prove to Morris that he was fearing for no reason. John and Rose left for their house after dinner. I had another glass of wine. Morris read a book for a while, sitting near the fireplace. To break the awkward silence between us, I said, You know, I was just joking. Don't be mad at me. Morris looked at me with cold eyes and said, I'd better get some sleep. Good night. I decided to sleep on the matter too. After one hour, I got up and walked to the kitchen. I was cleaning the remaining dishes when my eyes went to the ceiling above my head. I saw that a small crack had appeared on it. For a second, my stomach dropped in fear. Has it started already? Did I really summon the crooked man? But then I got back to my senses and realized the house we live in is quite old. Hence, it is natural to see such cracks and damages in the old walls. The clock in the hallway struck two. I was about to head upstairs just when I heard a soft knock on the main door. Now my eyes were dizzy. I realized that I was drunk. So with stumbling footsteps, I went towards the main door. I stood in front of the door and said, Who's there? A whispering sound came from the other side of the door. I asked again, Anybody there? No reply came. I turned around and started to walk. As soon as I took the first step, someone banged loudly on the door, almost scaring me to the core. I turned around and screamed, Whoever you are, I am not going to open the door! I then ran to my bedroom in fear. The bedroom door was closed from the inside, but I could hear a muffled, sobbing voice, as if someone was gagging in pain. I tried to open the lock, but it was locked from the inside. I banged on the door. Morris, why did you lock the door? The crying sound grew louder this time. I pushed the door hard and attempted to break it. The door opened, making a loud thud. What I saw next shook me from the inside. There was a bony, tall, vicious-looking man standing in the middle of the room. He was grabbing my husband by his neck and twisting his arms like a puppet. I could tell that my husband was numb with pain. He was becoming unconscious with every snap of the bone. I screamed at the top of my lungs just when the creature looked at me. Yes, I saw his face. I saw the crooked man. I couldn't save my husband that night. When the neighbors came, they found me unconscious on the floor. Our room was ravaged. It's been a year now since my husband passed away. He remained in a coma for a month and then died in his sleep. I came to know about the secret organization SCP who are taking charge of capturing this evil creature. I heard they have named the Crooked Man SCP-783. They claim that no one who saw him was left to describe how he looked, but I want to tell him that I saw him that night. If you can please contact me, it's now the mission of my life to catch the killer of my husband and finish him once and for all. For the past few days, I've been going through a traumatic phase. This all started once I opened my OnlyFans account. I'm a 30-year-old divorced woman. I was being raised by a drug-addicted mother. My mom often passed out on the house floor, being high on drugs. I kind of raised myself, being honest. After I finished high school, I eloped with my boyfriend Matt, and we started living on our own. But we were young, and sooner or later we became annoyed with each other. I started waitressing at a local restaurant. One day, I was about to finish my shift and leave for home when I overheard a random conversation. A girl was sitting at the corner table, talking to some guy in a very flirtatious manner. I heard her saying, Well, for that you have to subscribe to my OnlyFans account. It's not much, only 
After coming home that night, I couldn't help but think about what the girl was saying. I checked this website, OnlyFans, and realized it can be an easy way to earn some instant cash. It allows content creators to receive funding directly from their fans monthly, as well as one-time tips and pay-per-view features. This seemed like a golden opportunity to me, hence, without thinking much, I opened an account. I was never a shy type, hence, with time, I didn't hesitate to show some skin. I started to receive payments from fans all around the world. Every night after coming home, I sat down in front of the laptop wearing nice clothes. I talked with my fans and sent them pictures in exchange for $5, sometimes 10 Sites like these often attract creepy guys as well. I tried to handle people like that tactfully, and whenever I couldn't, I ended up blocking them. I never gave too much information to anyone, such as my home address or phone number for safety purposes. There were many requests of people who wanted me to add them to my social media accounts, such as Facebook, but I never did. I wanted to keep these interactions extremely professional. With time, my fan base grew, and I was getting a fair amount of money to support my livelihood. Now, all this time, people asked for intimate pictures, but I remained too careful to save myself from internet fraud. So, I never posted any picture that revealed my face. As I already said, I wanted to be safe as well. One weekend, I was sitting in my room talking to some of my fans when I received a notification. A guy named Ted underscore B subscribed to my channel. Out of humbleness, I texted him saying, thanks for the subscription. The guy replied, I had to, you make me go crazy. I laughed hearing this compliment and said, how sweet of you. Ted started to talk to me about his regular life. He said that he worked at a department store and is currently single. I didn't want to share too much, hence, I lied, saying I'm a 25-year-old woman working as a model. He replied, Hell yeah, you got the beautiful figure. Since then, Ted became one of my most alert fans. Whenever I uploaded a picture and made any post, he was the first to like it and comment on it. He never said anything inappropriate, so I didn't see any red flags. I went on a hiking trip for three days. After coming back, I immediately opened my OnlyFans account for not being able to stay active for a long time. As soon as I opened the account, notifications flooded in. I was expecting this, but I noticed my inbox and saw 45 messages. I was shocked because I never got that many texts before. I opened the message box. Surprisingly, all those texts were only from one guy, Ted underscore B. I started scrolling through his messages. Hey, what's up? Hello? You there? Why aren't you replying? Seems like you're too busy, huh? I pay you. It's your job to entertain me. The more I scrolled, the more his angry, irritated text scared me off. He started using slang and foul language for not receiving replies to his texts. I wanted to remove him from my fan base, but I didn't. I know I should have understood right then and there. I texted him back saying, sorry, went on a hiking trip. How are you? After 10 to 15 minutes, a reply came. Who the hell do you think you are? Ted underscore B replied. I said, what? He went on with his hurtful rantings. Yeah, you are nothing more than a slut, you bitch. This time, I finally lost my calm and replied. Go to hell, you freak, and blocked him. He was probably typing more obscene messages for me, but I didn't wait to see that. I chatted with some other fans and went to bed in an awful mood. A few days later, something weird started to happen. No matter where I went, I felt that someone was following me. For example, I went to the supermarket to buy a few things. After being done with the shopping, I went to the counter to pay the bill. As soon as I turned to the exit, I saw someone swiftly move away. I didn't see anyone in particular, but the feeling of being followed started to annoy and frighten me at the same time. One night, I was coming home from work. I stopped at the bus stand. I often took the bus, which happened to arrive at 8 p.m. I sat down on the bus stand and got busy on my phone while waiting for the bus to arrive. Suddenly, a text popped up from an unknown number. Hi, how's everything? I replied. Who is it? Your friend. I thought maybe someone was playing jokes with me, so I didn't reply anymore. 
Within a few seconds, another text came from the same number. So you don't want to talk, huh? I still ignored it. A few moments went by and I got a text. I opened it and my face turned pale in fear. My hands trembled as I read the text with shocked eyes. It read, The red shirt is looking amazing on your beautiful figure. I sprang upon fear. I looked around me, but it was an empty street. There was nothing but street lights and this small bus stop. How did he know that I was wearing a red shirt? The hair on the back of my neck stood up in fear. Is this guy around me right now? I screamed in a loud voice. Is anybody there? But no reply came. I replied to the text. Who the hell are you? Within a few seconds, a reply came reading. Your crazy fan. My stomach dropped in fear. I had no doubts that this was the psycho guy from OnlyFans named Ted underscore B. I had no idea how he got my phone number. I called his number and what happened next. Well, let me tell you, I never felt death from this close before. As soon as I dialed the number, a ringtone started to go off in the near distance. I looked at the bush nearby and saw a bony man coming out of it. The man came out behind the bush and stood in the middle of the road. I couldn't see his complete face, but his eyes were like a dead goat. It was so still and dangerously calm. The man then spoke in a spine-chilling voice. You should never upset your crazy fan. Do you want me to chase you? <laughs> he then started to run at full speed towards me. I screamed at the top of my lungs and ran for my life. I looked back once and saw the dark figure chasing me like a wild cat. All I could spot was his hungry eyes. I ran as fast as possible. Thankfully, I saw headlights coming from the other side of the road. There was a car coming in the opposite direction. The car stopped in front of me and I fainted on the road. The car owner took me to the hospital. Later, I went with the cops to report about this guy. The cops couldn't catch him because I failed to see his full face. Time went by and I came across an article about a serial killer named Ted Bundy. Right then, this terrifying feeling struck me. Ted underscore B. He named his profile Ted underscore B. It scares me to sleep to think that there are sick people in this world who idealize these horrifying criminals and even tries to follow their path. I don't know where this guy is now, but I hope he's not planning to turn himself into a monster like the serial killer, Ted Bundy. This is probably the first time that I'm opening up to people. I've been on a run for the last month. I'm not gonna disclose my name because I don't wanna go to prison. Before you sympathize with me, let me tell you that I am the bad guy in this story. Hence, I am paying for what I did. I'm a 34-year-old American male. I had a bad habit of gambling for which I could never do savings for myself. When my landlord warned me for the one last time that if I didn't pay the rent next month, he'll throw me out into the streets, I finally decided to do something with my miserable life. I took a job at Ikea. I used to arrange the store and shift unwanted pieces of furniture to the basement. Then, after the customers left, I used to clean the floor and leave for home. The manager of the store gave me a spare key for the store, as I became the last one to leave this place. The job was boring, but this was my only way to earn some cash. Sometimes I used to sleep in the expensive mattresses of the store after it got closed. I kind of liked roaming around the store pretending that I am in my home and these are all my furnitures. But I was always careful with the furniture so that no harm took place on them. Slowly, things started to settle down for me. I got a small raise and my life was taking a good turn. But it seems like I am my biggest enemy, which is why I ruined everything for once and all. One weekend, I went to a bar to drink and chill for some time. After a long time, I touched alcohol. Hence, I crossed my limits and drank a lot. It was a local bar and there were only a few people around. I looked at my phone and saw it was 9 p.m. I was thinking to leave when my eyes went to the other side of the bar. A girl was sitting at the bar and drinking beer. 
She looked at me, and our eyes met. There was something in her stare that made me feel like she was interested in me. She smiled at me, and I smiled back at her. I then got up and walked up to her with stumbling feet. I was feeling quite drunk. I said, Hey, are you waiting for someone? She <laughs> laughed in a teasing manner and said, What do you think? I realized that she was playing with me. I got close to her and said, If you're not waiting for anyone, you can come with me. The girl got up immediately and said, Okay, let's go. I wasn't expecting such a prompt reply, so I got a bit surprised. We came out of the bar and got into my car. She said, Do you think you should be driving? I smiled awkwardly, because I was feeling too drunk to drive at that moment. The girl smiled again and said, Here, give me your keys, I'll drive. Without thinking much, I gave her my keys. She started the engine, and we hit the road. So, where are we going? She asked. I replied, We can go to my place, or there's a place where I can take you too. She looked at me with curious eyes and said, Where? I told her that I work at Ikea and that I have the keys to sneak inside. She laughed and agreed to go with me there. We arrived near the store at 11 p.m. I unlocked the door and we went inside. I saw her eyes dazzled as soon as we entered the door. She started to run around like an excited little girl. Sometimes she sat on the wooden chairs, and other times she was lying on every couch and mattress in the store. I understood that she was excited, but the way she was running around and touching the furniture, I got a bit worried. Hey, slow down. Please don't break anything. My boss doesn't know I come here after work hours. She laughed and sat on a wooden table nearby. I walked up to her hoping for something to happen between me and her, when she said, so, do you bring all of your girls here for casual hookups? Honestly, I never brought anyone there before. So I said, Oh, God, no. I'm not that kind of guy. Honestly, you're the first girl I brought here. I saw her face change suddenly. She looked around and said in a curious voice, Um, do you mind telling me where your boss keeps the store cash? What? Why? I said. She got up and said, well, we can check, you know. Don't you want to be rich? And she <laughs> smiled mysteriously. I understood that I brought trouble into this place. Her words didn't feel right to me. So I said in an awkward tone, You know, this place is stuffy. Why don't we go to my house and do something fun? I left the car keys on the table she was sitting on before. So, without wasting any more time, I went towards them and picked them up to leave. As I turned back at her, my heart stopped. She was holding a sharp knife and grinning at me. What are you doing? I said. She smiled and said, Take me to the cash counter before I spill your entrails out. Oh my god. This woman was trying to rob the store. That's why she came so willingly with me. Look, you're making a big mistake. I'll be in trouble if something happens to the store. I said in a panting voice. Uh, I don't care, you dumb shit. Just take me to the cash counter, or I will stab you to death right now. She replied. Out of fear, I started to walk towards the cash counter. I was still feeling drunk, hence I couldn't take any chance to tackle her, because she was the one who had a weapon with her. The only thing that has been going in my mind is that if she robs this place and leaves, the entire suspicion will come on me. There hasn't been a break-in as I opened the door and let her in. Except for the store manager, I'm the only one who has a spare key. We reached the counter and she rushed to the small cupboard where the cash was kept. She hit the small lock on the cupboard with the butt of her knife and the lock broke. There were bundles of notes inside the cupboard. Her eyes dazzled as she looked at the money. She kept the knife on the slab of the counter and started to fill her bag with the money. She was occupied with such greed that she almost forgot I was standing close to her. As soon as she let go of her weapon, I thought that this was my chance to stop her. I picked up the knife and said, Stop! I'm calling the cops right now! She turned back to me and screamed like an animal. She then jumped on me to get her knife back. We were tackling each other, and amid that, a terrible accident took place. 
I accidentally stabbed her in the chest. Blood poured down from her mouth and chest. She held her chest and I saw fear and pain in her eyes at the same time. She then crouched down on the floor and choked for a while. Oh my god, are you alright? I, I didn't mean to. I tried to stop her bleeding, but it was already too late. I saw her body becoming still within a wink. And she died. Yes. I murdered her. I committed murder. I am a murderer now. But what I did next makes me evil, I guess. I sat down on the floor and watched her dead body for a few minutes, then got up to end this nightmare, only if I knew that I could never do that. I wrapped her body in a plastic sheet and then locked her in an old Almira under the basement. She's still lying there. I cleaned the floor, washed off all the blood, and since then, I've been on the run. I drive most of the days, so that I can go as far as possible. At night, I take shelter in the roadside motel. I took some money from the Ikea store, because it will help me to suffice. I don't know how long I'll be able to continue like this. I'm sure the cops are looking for me, or maybe not. I'm not sure. The only thing that is ten times scarier than this entire incident is when I lay on the bed to sleep. I hear her, no matter where I go. I see her standing near my bed in the middle of the night, holding her bloody chest while blood keeps gushing out of her mouth. She just stares at me with her horrible, lifeless grin and says, Let me go. Let me go. LET ME GO! This might not be the so-called horror story, but it's the scariest encounter of my life. I worked as a security guard in a shopping mall. Generally, the mall opened at 10 and closed at around 8 almost every day. Every night, I closed the mall at 9 p.m. sharp and returned home. Most hours of my work passed by sitting in front of my computer screen and watching the footage captured by the security cameras. I could see couples romancing, kids running around the mall, and people going up and down in the mall elevator. It was a busy Saturday evening. The crowd in the mall increased so much that we all had to come out and keep an eye on everyone to avoid any kind of ill behavior. At around 7.30, people started to leave for home. I finally got back to the security room and sat down. My co-worker, Adam, said, oh, What a hectic day. I told the manager not to put special offers on all the shops on the same day. People go crazy when they get discounts. I laughed and said, Yeah, <laughs> couldn't agree with you more. Hey, listen, I'm going to head home early today. Uh, the keys are in the drawer. If you could just lock up at around 8, that'd be great, man. Awesome. Well, have a happy weekend. I'll uh, see you Monday. Adam left and I started to arrange the footage in proper orders. Keeping the footage in perfect order is a crucial job. You never know what kind of crime or uncanny incident might lead to the cops making an arrest. At around 8pm, I got up and went to the top floor of the mall to check the door locks and shops. After making my complete round of the mall, I became sure that no one was here except for me. I went back to the security room and started to shut down the power system of each floor, one by one. The last step was to switch off the security cameras. As I went ahead to do so, my eyes got stuck on the screen. I saw a middle-sized petite woman standing inside the elevator. She was wearing a red dress. I couldn't see her face as she was facing her back at the camera. I pressed the microphone button for elevator announcements and said, Um, ma'am? The mall's closed, ma'am. Please, if you could just come out of the elevator. You can come tomorrow. The woman didn't pay any attention to my announcements. She didn't even look at the camera once. She stood like that for a few seconds and started to behave weirdly. The elevator probably opened on the second floor. She peeked from the elevator as if someone was standing outside, but I could see the entire corridor of the second floor. It was completely empty. The woman looked at her left and then her right. She then came back inside the elevator. She then did a really creepy thing that freaked me out. She started to press all of the buttons of the elevator like a maniac. I tried to warn her by saying, Ma'am, if you don't come downstairs, I'm going to have to go to the second floor and escort you out myself. Please don't make me do that. Just come downstairs. 
This time, the woman looked at the camera, and what I saw ran a chilling shiver down my spine. She had no eyes. Her eyes were hollow, with no eyeballs in them. She then walked close to the camera and kept staring at it. I don't know what to say because what I was witnessing in front of my eyes spooked me like hell. Suddenly, the security camera started to malfunction. The image started to cut out and blur for no reason. These are newly installed cameras, so there was no valid reason for it to act in such a way. I pressed the microphone button again, saying, Ma'am, I am telling you for the last time. But the sound got cut out too. The microphone stopped working. A coarse sound of wires crushing to each other surrounded the speakers. The elevator stopped at the top floor of the mall, which was the fourth floor. I saw the floor number flashing on the elevator screen. The footage was cutting on and off this whole time. As the elevator door opened, she looked at it and then again looked back at the camera and said in a whispering voice, The roof. The camera stopped recording and the screen went black. I rushed towards the elevator and pressed the button. The elevator started to come down, which obviously pointed out that someone did go up on it. Before this woman, I was the last person to use the elevator, and I perfectly remember I came to the ground floor on it after making my usual rounds. The elevator door opened, and there was no one inside. I checked the entire mall once again. I even thought that she might have gone up to the roof, so I took the stairs to the roof. But the roof door was already locked, and Adam had the key, so there was no way that she could get up there. This wasn't the weirdest incident, though. I went back and fixed the security camera, which I had no idea why it malfunctioned in the first place. I then went through the footage again, and I found out there was no trace of this mystery woman in any footage of the last hour. My phone rang, and I saw it was my wife. I noticed it was 9pm and realized that she must be worried about me. I took the call and said, Sorry, honey, I I'm coming home now. That entire night, I couldn't sleep, because nothing was making any sense to me. Who was that woman? Why did she tell me to go to the roof when it was locked in the first place? The next day, I woke up late. I sat down at the dinner table when suddenly my phone rang. Hello? I said. A man with a serious voice replied, Hey, this is Officer Pratt from the local police department. Are you Matthew Scott? Yes. What's the matter, officer? I said in a surprised tone. Can you come to the mall? We're running an inquiry here and we need all mall staff for the process. The man then hung up the phone. Getting a call from the cops is not something everyone enjoys to start their day with. That being said, I went to the mall. I went inside and saw officers interrogating each and every mall worker. A tall officer came up to me. Are you Mr. Scott? Uh, yes, sir. I nervously responded. The officer then took out a small photograph and showed it to me. Do you know this girl? He said. My eyes widened in shock. It was the same girl from the elevator footage last night. Yeah, I saw her last night. She was behaving really odd. I don't know how she managed to sneak inside the mall after closing hours, and I even checked the entire floor. She must have left on her own, too. There was something really wrong with the way that she was behaving. After I finished saying all of this, I noticed everyone around me looking at each other. Two more officers came towards me and said, Are you absolutely sure you saw her last night? I replied, Yeah, it was her. But why are you asking? Officer Pratt looked at me and said, Show me the elevator footage. Awkwardly, I said, That's the weirdest part, officer. The camera started to malfunction on its own and I checked the footage later, but she wasn't in any of them. The officers exchanged a curious look among each other. Then one of them said, This girl has been missing for a week now. Do you think we're stupid? Drops of sweat started to appear on my forehead. What the hell is going on here? Officer Pratt then said, Look, we have this information that the girl was last seen in the mall one week earlier. Show me the footage from last week. I knew that I was becoming a suspect for revealing the incidents that I encountered last night. Without any more delay, I took them to the security room and gave them all the footage they asked for. Within three hours, 
The cops spotted her coming into the mall, getting into the elevator, and going to the fourth floor. The time showed 8 p.m. I was surprised to see her coming to the mall after the closing hours. Suddenly, I remembered Adam was in charge of that night. I told the cops how the girl told me to go to the roof last night, which I couldn't as Adam keeps the roof key. The officers looked at Adam and said, Give us the key to the roof. Unexpectedly, Adam tried to run away. The cops arrested him and broke into the roof. After searching, the cops found the woman's body wrapped inside garbage bags and hidden under the water tank. Adam had apparently been cheating on his wife with this poor, innocent woman. She came to end things with him that night. She might have insulted him, which led to a fight between them. Things must have gotten out of hand, and Adam killed her by strangling her to death. He then hid her body on the roof to get away with the crime. Or he might have planned to get rid of the body when the time was right. Maybe he was planning to do that soon, which is why her haunting spirit came to inform me last night. Are ghosts real? I don't know, but I can assure you that last night I did see the same girl in the elevator who was laying dead for a week on the roof of this mall. My name is Adam, and I'm a financial broker. My work schedule is always crowded with meetings and appointments. I had to take so many phone calls that often at night in my sleep, I woke up randomly thinking my phone was ringing. I barely get the time to hang out with my friends or family. My girlfriend broke up with me recently because I was too busy to spend time with her. To be honest, that's when it hit me that I need a break from work. It's been three years since I joined this company, and since then I have not taken a single leave. So I decided to go to a small hill station and spend a week or so. My leave request got accepted immediately for my dutiful performance so far. I came home from work one day and started to prepare for this long needed trip. I booked flights and a room in a hotel at the hill station. I wanted to stay close to nature, away from the crowd, so I chose these not so famous serene hill station. After landing at the airport, I hired a cab to reach the exact location. Within half an hour, we left the city area and got onto the twisted mountain roads. At one side stood the steep edge meeting the green mountain valley. On the other side, huge mountains. I opened the glass window of the car and let the cool breeze touch my face. Is this your first time here, sir? Yeah, it is. I'm staying at the Holiday Inn Hotel. How is that place? It's one of the oldest hotels in the Hill Station. But you are lucky. You got a booking just at the right moment. Why do you say that? The hotel was closed for one year. It was renovated and reopened last week. I see. Good. They renovated the place. No, sir. It wasn't for renovation. It was for the suicide. I was startled to hear this, so I said confusingly, Suicide? Who committed suicide? The owner's wife. She was going mad. People say she roamed the hotel at night scaring the guests. The owner decided to send her to a mental institution. But right before that night she was about to be shifted, she jumped from the hotel roof into the wild valley. It took two days for the cops to discover her body. When they found the body, it was a vicious sight to watch. Coyotes and wolves tore flesh from that poor woman's body. Oh, what a horrible scene. The car driver closed his eyes, recalling the dead body. A weird feeling of discomfort grabbed my senses. I started to ponder on the thought, will it be fine to stay at a place where someone committed suicide? But then my rational senses replied, if we think like that, we will not be able to stay anywhere, because someone is always dying here and there. Also, the driver just said that the hotel had been renovated. When I reached the hotel, my eyes dazzled with the beauty of the view. Being surrounded by blue, snowy mountains, this three-story wooden hotel stood like an ideal place to escape the busy city life. I checked in and a hotel boy escorted me to my room. The room was cozy and the view of the valley from the window refreshed my mind. I kept my luggage in the room and decided to eat something. I locked the room and started to walk towards the dining hall. I was near the dining hall when I saw an old tall man standing there and talking to the hotel boy. 
He looked at me and I smiled out of courtesy. Welcome to the Holiday Inn. I hope you're enjoying your stay, the old man said. Yeah, this is a beautiful place, I replied with a smile. Good to hear that. I am John Kipsky, the owner of the hotel. Please make yourself at home. Do not hesitate to ask for anything. He then looked at the hotel boy and said, Attend to our guest, Matthew, and left. Sir, please come with me, Matthew said. He took me to the dining hall. I sat down at a table, and the boy went to the counter to call the waiter. So far, I haven't seen any other guests. I was looking around when my eyes went to the wall in front of me. I saw a huge oil painting hanging from the wall. I got up to see it properly. It was the portrait of a woman. She was wearing a black gown and had an ordinary face. The only striking feature was her eyes. They were extremely creepy and bright. Once you look into her eyes, you can tell something is odd with this woman. Her stare was so uncomfortable that I felt she could see into my soul. The even more disturbing thing was the way the painter drew her eyes. It felt like she was following everyone in this room at all times. I was contemplating on these thoughts when someone spoke in a broken, deep voice. That's Mrs. Kipsky. She's dead. I turned around and saw a man dressed in the waiter's costume, standing right next to me. He had white hair and looked like someone who had been there for a while. I said awkwardly, I was just looking at the painting. I then walked back to my seat and started to look through the menu card. The waiter stood quietly with a blank face. I was taking quite a bit of time to decide on what to eat, but this guy seemed like he had a lot of time to spare. He waited patiently until I ordered my food. As long as I ate there, I couldn't shrug off this uncanny feeling of being watched by that woman in the painting. I finished as quickly as possible and went back to my room. I smoked a cigar sitting near the window and watched the sunset behind the hills. I don't remember when I dozed off on the couch. I woke up hearing muffled laughter in my room. I opened my eyes and saw a woman figure sitting on the couch like a frog. Her hands were placed on my legs. Her face was full of wrinkles. She was wearing a black gown. There was a cruel smile on her face, but her eyes were coming out of her eye sockets. Seeing her eyes, I could recognize her. I just saw her painting in the dining hall today. Yes, it was Mrs. Kipsky. But, but you're, you're dead. <laughs> she stood up on the couch and started to cough terribly. Hearing her coughing like this, I got up. She was gagging like she couldn't breathe. Then she suddenly stopped and said, would you like to see a magic trick? She started to pull her tongue out with her very own hands. I screamed in terror and couldn't believe my eyes. She was pulling and pulling, and her huge red bloody tongue was coming out of her mouth. I will never forget that scene. Hearing my scream, the hotel boy came rushing to my room. Thank God I didn't lock my door. He bolted inside and switched on the light. What happened, sir? Is everything all right? I looked around while gasping for air. There was no one inside. Only the window was moving with the cold wind. I left the hotel the next day. I went to the dining hall for one last time. My eyes went to the painting. Believe me or not, I saw Mrs. Kipsky wickedly smiling at me.